We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. I'm enjoying this year's NHL offseason because we've got the Seattle team coming in and it's creating all kinds of intrigue in the offseason. So, so that, that's that been fun. I It's a shame I don't like hockey yeah. or I don't care about hockey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if I cared about hockey, I could be gloating, right? Is this like two years in a row right, that That's right, yeah, won? Tampa Bay. Yes, you know, they only had to cheat to win, but good for them. They cheated within the rules by the what? letter of the law, so... Congratulations! <laughs> you played the system. Sounds like sour grapes. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> I yeah. They were thirteen really million dollars over the salary cap while playing in the playoffs. That I have no idea what that means. Good for them. Doesn't matter to me because I don't care. <laughs> uh, I love to watch hockey during the Olympics. I like right. to watch uh, teams that are based in countries, which feels a little bit more like the game Risk mm. than it does feel like uh, <laughs> Tampa Bay trying to defend. I mean, I don't care about. I like. I, I never lived, I've lived in a lot of big cities mm -hmm. that have sports teams, but I didn't grow up in a big city that had a sports mm. team. So maybe that's it. But I, you know, I lived close to the Oakland Raiders when they were um, huge. I lived close to San Francisco 49ers when they were huge. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Giants. It's you, Tom. All that You're stuff. good luck. You brought good luck to Florida for two years in a row. <laughs> that's not, definitely not the case. <laughs> but. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I remember when was it was at Bahrain or somebody like that it was quite a few years ago, uh, back when I was in college, um, they were going through a huge run, like they were the massive underdogs and nobody expected them to do anything and they were doing really good. I was getting up at like 2 a.m. to watch <laughs> in hockey? Olympic games. Olympic hockey? Yeah, in hockey. That was probably Belarus. Might have been Bahrain. It was probably Belarus. Belarus, that's it. I always say Bahrain, but it's Belarus, <laughs> yes. And I was so invested in that. Ah. Uh, but... Uh, I just can't care about teams from. <laughs> well, we'll from see what happens in cities, 2022 nice, yes. if that Olympics takes place, Winter Olympics. And yeah, NHL hasn't decided whether they're going to let NHL players play in the Olympics in 2022 or not. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, yeah. There's that. And there's also how great the Summer Olympics are going so far. It hasn't even started yet. And everybody's, you know, oh, and so and so came down with, and so and so can. And they have a don't ask, don't tell policy about, I'm like, right. What? There is a home <laughs> oh theater God. related aspect to the Summer Olympics. They are going to be broadcasting in 4K AK. and HDR and Atmos audio. And I did comment I on Twitter. I thought they were doing 8K. They're not doing 8K? Well, they in North America. There's 8K in Japan and in South Korea, they'll have 8K. South Korea, yes. Uh, but in North okay. America, there'll be 4K. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, Atmos in arenas with no crowds. I, I don't I don't really know about how Atmos is going to be super applicable. I mean, they should do it like they do the X Games. Whenever they do the X Games. I have uh, friends who have worked on the sound design or mm -hmm. the sound whatever for x games and you know all those crashes and sound effects and hmm. noise cheering and stuff, they add all that stuff up you know okay. it's like a slight delay to yeah, what's yeah, actually yeah. going on in the screen and they just add it all you know they have like a truck full of guys and that's what their job is you know the video right. comes in they add they add the sound effects and they send it out like okay. you know 30 seconds a minute later or something like that and it, it, it it's basically live which is crazy but it's kind of cool it's kind of cool all right this is av rant the podcast that answers your home theater and av questions get your questions answered all you have to do is ask ask by emailing us a question at av rant.com you can uh, go to av rant.com leave us a comment there facebook.com slash av rant podcast youtube.com slash av rant contact rob directly rob av rant.com his twitter's at first reflect i'm tom at av rant.com my twitter's at av rant underscore tom mm -hmm. all right uh let me see here. We got some. I guess uh, was, oh, this is what is that? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna scroll down. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week. You support the podcast in some way. If uh, you are so inclined, you go to patreoncom podcast where you can sign up to be a ongoing contributing listener to our podcast, which means you support us financially once a month, just like a paycheck. You're giving us a paycheck, and that paycheck can be as little as one dollar. That's right. That's one dollar. For eight hours plus of our voices, yeah, or at least Rob's voice, yeah. every month, 
which seems like if you do the math, it's... Yeah, that's right. Less than minimum wage, I would say. I would say it was slightly less than minimum wage, no matter what country you're That's in. That's right. I mean, even in even in some of those countries where the minimum wage doesn't exist, mm. it's less than that. <laughs> so we have 127 patrons currently uh, over at patreon.com. That includes James W., uh, who's part of our Two Hour Plus Club. So thank you to our patrons. Indeed, patreon.com slash podcast. If you would like to sign up to give us a minimum of a dollar a month automatically, thanks very much to our 127 patrons over there. James W., thank you for being one of them. We also got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going during the currently ongoing pandemic. Yeah. So we've got uh, Justin, uh, who says he, he's we have helped him stay up to speed on the latest in the AV and stuff like that, even though he's between houses right now. Brandon, Grinder, Rob, not you, different one. Oh. Jeremy, who says he's been listening for many, many years, and James. So thank you, Justin, Brandon, Grinder, Rob, Jeremy, and James. Indeed, I'll repeat the names one more time. Justin, Brandon, Grinder, Rob, Jeremy, and James. Thank you all very much for those notes of gratitude, notes of encouragement. We definitely appreciate it. It's wonderful that this community has continued on this entire time, still going strong. And thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Now that we've thanked the listeners of the week, I'll say a thank you to DJ. He had me on as a guest on his podcast, Bright Side. What did you guys talk about? Last week. Uh, we so we we used a question that came in from one of our mutual listeners um where he was basically saying that he had watched the tomorrow war on amazon prime and did not which i have a lot of comments about okay. by the way if you want to talk about reviewing a movie i can we, review that movie. we weren't reviewing the movie so much as um uh i'm pretty sure it was mitch who wrote in uh to dj and was saying you know he had mistakenly ended up watching the HD resolution 5.1 audio version of it because Amazon Prime mm. has that ridiculous thing where they have multiple listings for the same movie rather than having one splash page with maybe the option to choose what quality you watch it or what everybody wants, which is just you automatically get the highest quality that's available to you based on whatever I don't know hardware what mine was. You're using. I never even noticed that. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, he was basically just sort of asking about the, the situation there and how to make sure you're getting the best. And then that led us to all kinds of discussion about streaming in general and quality in general where we think things might be going so uh naturally uh we had planned on about an hour long podcast and it turned out to be two hours long because i was on a podcast and i seem to be incapable of going for a length of time less than two hours on a podcast but uh thank you to dj That's for right. doing that and uh i Rob's also like a reverse carp like carps right. will grow to the size of whatever <laughs> pool they're in whatever podcast rob's on grows to rob's size which is two hours <laughs> and i wanted to give some kudos to uh xbox support um i had mentioned how my nephew's xbox series x had this crazy glitch and i'm showing an image on screen now if you're on youtube uh, just a you know a, a still image uh that was literally a photograph of the tv screen um uh, but yeah, that was the before situation with these ridiculous black blocks and white speckles all over the place that you might have guessed was like an HDMI problem if if yeah. uh, you know you were just looking at that. But it only applied to Xbox 360 games, and it wasn't this bad on every Xbox 360 games. This is Fallout 3, which was the worst example. Uh, and then I had another Xbox Series X console of my own that didn't have this problem at all. So uh, sent that off to uh, Microsoft, and in less than two weeks, it came back. I have an image showing on that system that came back to me. Uh, Fallout 3 is looking perfect now, just like it did on the Xbox Series X that I swapped over to my nephew so that he would not have to wait. So very fast service. The the vast majority of the time of me being without my Xbox Series X was just shipping time since it went from British Columbia over to Ontario and back again. Uh, so uh, yeah, all of that in less than two weeks. Very pleased with the speed and the quality of the customer service. So kudos to Microsoft and Xbox support. Cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I tested mine and I didn't see this, but I'm not on the 4K display and there's... Sure. I mean, I don't I know. I mean, there's no reason. It's, it's I, not I, like... I, it, I, I have a game that did right. this. So. It's not like it affects all <laughs> Xbox 360 games on all Xbox Series X consoles. I had a console that was perfectly fine. My nephew had one that had this weird glitch, but uh, yeah. Not not exactly sure what it was because other games are fine. So it's definitely not the GPU. It's not the HDMI port. It's got to be some kind of tiny little chip in there that has something to do this with Xbox a, 360 backwards compatibility. Kind of a good example, though. This is this is kind of what like when people are like, I think I have a problem with my HBA, right. HDMI. I'm like, no, you don't, because <laughs> this is what like this is a, this is 
almost exactly what a real like I'm right at the end of the bandwidth right. and my com- and it's it's not so much that it knocks off the the handshake but completely yeah it is so much that it's where I'm not the data is not all getting through cleanly this is what it looks yeah. like it looks exactly it's not like this subtle. it's it's, it's, not, that it's the... not like ah the colors look a little <laughs> off right. no <laughs> it's, it's a time I, I see a hair less detail no 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 it's it's really very right, obvious right, right. when there's something this wrong this is this is what <laughs> hdmi not working looks like even though that's not what's happening here Indeed. it Indeed. is a perfect example i need to get like you need to send me these pictures or okay. i need to grab them somehow yeah. so that i can use this as a as an example on uh av gadgets so um all right let's get to the some news here mm-hmm. valve announced something that i couldn't I, I cared so little about yeah. that i saw it and thought this is probably a story for av gadgets and went yeah. Ugh, and just didn't do it that's <laughs> you, how i felt you about talked this. about the nintendo switch oled model so this this could I have did. gone on av gadgets could have gone right on there next to that one instead tom said eh. Uh-huh. So it's called, anyways. The Valve announced the Steam Deck, That's a right. portable handheld gaming PC, starting at four hundred bucks with a 1280 by eight hundred seven inch screen. Comparisons were immediately drawn to the Switch, but do PC games really want a ro- uh, low resolution, low frame rate handheld device? I tell you what, I played Slay the Spire, which is a deck building roguelike, you know, not action at all game mm-hmm. on my phone the other day, and I was like. I can't read any of this. It's <laughs> so small. Like, I can't tell how many hit points I have. I can't ca- tell how much damage this is doing. I can't see anything on this screen. And I I mean, I do have a smaller than I normally have phone. I have a Pixel 5, which I, I really want a bigger. I like bigger phones. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's it was just ludicrous. So the answer to the question is nobody really wants this. But I'm sure somebody <laughs> will buy it. So Steam Deck comes in three models because they want you to buy the middle one. In case you're wondering Very why anybody so. yes. ever... Or offers three models initially out of the gate. <laughs> it's because they want they they want you to buy the middle one, and that's that's how that goes. It's like you don't want to spend, spend so much for the big one, and you don't want to cheap out and get the little one. You might you get the middle one. That's why they're making a lot of middle ones and a few of everything else. <laughs> so, the four hundred dollars will get you a sixty four gigs of somewhat slow storage. Uh, five hundred thirty dollars will give you uh six five two hundred fifty six gigs of. NVMe? Is that what NVMe? NVMe? Yeah, non-volatile mm-hmm. memory express. Yeah, there you go. I had to look that up. Whatever. All right. <laughs> uh, and 650 will get you uh, 512 gigabytes of the fastest NVMe storage plus an anti-glare screen. Mm-hmm. So they really, I mean, you see the, 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 the jump from the 400 to the 530. You go from 64 gigs of crap to 530 <laughs> gigs of pretty good. I mean, I mean, 256 gigs of pretty good for $130 more. You're like, I already spent 400 bucks, which is an extra 130 it should be ninety nine dollars if they were, you know, that should be the pricing model. But <laughs> clearly, they couldn't make that work. And then the six fifty is like, well, if you're going to pay more than five thirty, then we're going to really make you pay more than five thirty. <laughs> so six fifty, anyways. Inside, it's a, it's powered by an AMD, excuse me, APU with AMD's most up to date integrated graphics and sixty gigs of RAM. You can spend the storage of any of the models with a micro SD card. Out of the box, it runs SteamOS, which is built on Linux. Since the library of native Linux games remains relatively small, Valve is including their Proton translation software, which lets you run most Windows games. But the Steam Deck is basically just a small PC. Valve explicitly states you can wipe the Steam Deck and install Windows on it if you want to. Out of the box, it takes uh, you to the Steam Game Store, but you're free to use any uh to use other game stores and run any software on it you want so cryptocurrency i don't know <laughs> uh you know th- this is gonna th- it's like here's a handheld raspberry pi that's real expensive <laughs> yeah, kind of yeah i mean it's more powerful about. than that yeah yeah it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's well it's more powerful than a nintendo switch right. it's it is the the latest AMD technology, but it's in a single chip, so it's not a separate CPU and GPU. It's a combined APU, so it's the same as integrated graphics, but it's their latest technology that they've put in there, but it is like 15 watts total TDP for CPU and GPU, so this is not some crazy high-powered system. It's targeting 720p. It's basically targeting 30 frames per second for all intents and purposes. They talked about, yes, you can play games at 60 frames per second, but when you do so, the battery life shrinks to like one and a half hours maximum. <laughs> so it's really kind of targeting 720p, 30 frames per second. And when you think PC gaming, that's that's what you think. <laughs> when you think handheld gaming, you think, you know what? I'm right. not going to do it for longer than an hour and a half. I mean, how long does a plane Maybe. flight last? 
Never, never lie. You're never in the airport for longer than an hour and a half, right? <laughs> Total t travel time. Why would you want that? Anyways, they tend to release a dock, but you can use any USB-C adapters you want to add HDMI, DisplayPort, keyboard, and mouse, or any other connections to the uh, or peripherals. The first wave of pre-orders are supposed to ship in December. Ordering now will put some put you sometime in 2022 to receive your order from Valve. So it looks like a fat Nintendo Switch without detachable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The controllers yeah. do not detach. It has thumb pads directly below its thumb sticks. So for things that is that what those things are? Yes. So for things to that need to use a mouse, um, you can use the thumb pads down there, which they're kind of borrowing the technology they had from their Steam controllers, which they stopped selling yeah. a couple of years ago. Um, they were not successful with their Steam boxes, but they didn't make that hardware themselves, and you still had to have a PC running the actual game. The Steam box was just like a remote device to get it onto your television, which you could, you know, do with an NVIDIA Shield for less money. So, uh, yeah, the overall size of this Steam Deck is, like, if you take it, uh, a Nintendo Switch... Uh, and then just expand beyond where the thumbsticks on the Nintendo Switch are to the sides right. to add a D-pad and uh, and your A, B, X, Y buttons, then that's basically the, the size of this thing. It also weighs over two times as much as a Switch, so holding on mm. to it could potentially get a little bit tiring, just physically. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. Like, Coming I don't. Soon I don't know. To a bargain base, a bargain bin near you. I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know who's who's gonna dock I don't know it. Know what the market is for this? Yeah. Right, because docking it doesn't make it any more powerful. So if you want to play with keyboard and mouse, it doesn't have a kickstand. So you're kind of gonna end up docking it in order to play with keyboard and mouse, which is what a lot of I mean, yeah, PC gamers don't want to play with thumbsticks and buttons. Right, so if you dock it, then you plug it, it goes into your TV? Is that the deal? Yeah, or, or a monitor. But, you know, yeah. at 720p resolution at 30 or 60 frames per second, which PC gamers, that is not what they want. So, I mean, my nephew, again, we, we talked about this a little bit. He was like, yeah, it makes sense for people who like to emulate. That's that's what it's for. Oh, sure. Right? Okay, I can see that. Yeah, if you want yeah. to emulate games, so you wipe Steam OS off of it, you install Windows onto it, and you put an emulator on there, and then you load up a micro SD card with a bunch of pirated games, and you emulate well, them that all. that sounds a lot that's... like a Raspberry Pi, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> but I mean, that's what this makes sense for, right? Because it's not, I mean, you can do that kind of stuff on Nintendo Switch, but it's more difficult. This, when you can just put Windows on it right out of the box, is pretty darn easy. So, I mean, I don't right. think it's for high-end PC gaming. It wouldn't be a bad target if you want to do game streaming and have a portable device that you stream games onto. So, you know, it's got yeah. it's got some uses, but I mean, it's it's garnered quite a bit of excitement. Of course, there were people like, "Oh, this is going to kill the Nintendo Switch." I'm like, "No, it really. It really, really is not really, going to kill really the Nintendo not Switch." Do that. No, <laughs> there are no just, no game developers who are like, "Oh, well, I'm never putting another game on the Nintendo Switch that has what 90 million units out in the wild now <laughs> because the Steam Dock uh, deck exists yeah. now." Like, no, that that is not how things are going to go down. <laughs> there's like a niche there's a, like a niche it's the same thing with like movie reviewers talking about how we all that movie theater theaters are so important. We're going to get to that. You can it see is. I'm already thinking about it. Yes. But it's just like that. Those guys like, oh, movie theaters are so important and we can't we can't lose. We've got to start. Everybody's got to start going back to the movies. And that and the people who listen to this podcast are like, yeah, really? Are you sure? <laughs> are you sure that that's the case? And there's a niche <laughs> gamer that every time something Steam or Valve spits something out, they're like, this will change everything. Mm. You're like. Will it though? Yeah. Because the last three times they were supposed to change everything, it kind of changed nothing, <laughs> and then it went the way of the dodo, and you blame somebody else. But I mean, this so, is the problem. Uh, In order to bring the price to something close to mass market, you can't yeah. do 4K 120 on a portable device. Like it's a, these things are mutually exclusive at the moment. You can't get it that cheap. You'd have to put hit. You'd have to put heat sinks on it and fans. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's got it's got a thirty two pound battery pack, but right. it does four K one twenty. Uh, this definitely does not. I uh, I like I said, I couldn't be less excited about this. <laughs> I just don't, I don't think it, I I wouldn't be surprised if it gets delayed, delayed, and ah uh, yeah. But I I don't I'm not saying that's going to happen. But you know, I did hear that Emotiva was handling the <laughs> firmware updates for it. So there's that <laughs> nice. Netflix has hired a former Oculus and EA Mobile gaming executive as their new vice president of game development. Netflix reportedly 
aims to add game streaming to their service, similar to Google Stadia, which went so well, Xbox Cloud, Xbox Cloud Gaming, which I know nothing about, and Amazon Luna, which I don't know how successful they've been either. So, yay! But Netflix does have a huge, I mean, a huge infrastructure market presence yes. yeah i mean it's just they're I mean, everywhere yeah so the question is do you have to have a different app to do it i mean uh, the report will it be available through the actual app yeah the, the report i mean of course things can change because this doesn't exist yet but the right. reports were right. that their goal is to simply add this as another option to your existing netflix subscription that it wouldn't be a separate subscription it would just be like you know you go in there and you can look up movies versus tv shows right well you'd have another section right in there on the side menu for games uh and that's mm. that's what they're aiming for they're aiming to bring more value for your netflix subscription dollar and of course justify increasing the price of your netflix subscription that's what they're really hoping to do uh so i mean that's the plan right now that can easily change but it looks like netflix is aiming to get into the streaming gaming you know market yeah it's weird all these products and services that are essentially targeted targeted at man children you know what i mean i mean like every parent i know is doing everything they can to keep their kids from playing more games ah. like that's all we do is talk about <laughs> how much games our kids play mm. and how we can limit it in some way <laughs> shape or form and i i mean the reality is is it was probably the same thing in my day but i just didn't hear my parents talking about it but <laughs> you know there wasn't as many opportunities for gaming. Like in order for me to game, we had one TV in the house right. and it was connected to an Atari 2600. And if I wanted to game, I needed to have access to the TV, which I couldn't have mm -hmm. without kicking everybody else off of it. Nowadays, we have screens everywhere and yes. everything else. So it's a constant battle to keep kids focused <laughs> on getting their homework done or, mm. you know, putting out job applications or going to their sporting events and stuff like that. So... I see the Steam handheld device. I see, you know, all these game streaming services, and they're they seem to be firmly targeted at, you know, <laughs> boys that are turning into men age twenty five to thirty five who haven't gotten their crap together yet, and they've got tons of disposable income that's, and nothing to do with their lives. That's the real ticket: you know? disposable and, income and a desire to sit down and play some games and veg out, which is. Why you see all these death threats every every time somebody puts out a game that has a female main character? There, I'm like, uh, guys, guys, take a second, go outside, meet a woman. You know, I'm not saying that you're basement dwellers, but you're kind of fitting the bill. You need to, you need to to stop with that. But yeah, I don't know how how much longer that market is going going to be hugely viable. Um, yep. Maybe it'll become more so because we're uh, you're seeing more remote work and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. people are going to be even more and more at home. So maybe it will become more and more viable. I don't know, but it's to me at some point you grow out, you grow out of this. <laughs> like I would love to play video games. I love playing yeah. video games. I literally cannot, I cannot find the time to do it. The only reason I played Slay the Spider on my phone this week, which I downloaded on the day of release, hadn't, hadn't finished a full game yet when I right. got it, which was months ago. Uh, I was trapped in the doctor's office with my son mm -hmm. who was getting an allergy testing thing where they, they do the yeah. resistant testing, which take, took like four hours. <laughs> I was in there for four <laughs> hours. I was like, well, I, I'm going to play Slay the Spire. And no, that, that, that's how I... If nothing else, time. gamers should venture outside so that they can recognize when their incredibly overpriced and terrible headsets sound nothing like real life. That's, that's my new hill to die on. There you go. So the National Association of Theater Owners are saying that, and I just released an article about this today, okay. which is not not, not very po positive about them. <laughs> Anyways, the, the NATO, National Association of Theater Owners, are saying that simultaneous release, releases in theaters and day-to-date -day streaming are a pandemic-era artifact that should be left to history with the pandemic itself as the pandemic rages on. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. This comes after Black uh, Black Widow fell 67% in the second weekend at the box office, which is the biggest second week drop for any MCU movie ever. Space Jam A New Legacy took over the top spot while also being a day and date uh, on HBO Max. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things that were wrong with what they said. First of all, they backed up they backed up nothing they said with data of any kind. Sure. Uh, the only thing they, they linked up was uh, Torrent Freak's uh, rankings of the top stream a top torrented mm -hmm. movies now i don't know how they come up with those numbers and they certainly didn't list any numbers mm. they just said 
these, this was the one and we we're all supposed to believe him, which I'm, you know, I have no reason not to believe him. But one of the things they say in here is like, this doesn't happen to movies that didn't have day and date releases like mm. uh, F9, you know, Fast and Furious 9 mm -hmm. and A Quiet Place 2. And I looked on there, I'm like, uh, so the week before Black Widow was number one, a Quiet Place Two was number one. Yes, yeah. And the week that Black uh, Black Widow was number one, A Quiet Place Two was number three. So now F Nine or Fast and Furious Nine, I didn't find on there, but I didn't really look. But I was just like, uh, you guys aren't even really trying here. But the, <laughs> you know, and I can, and like I said, I wrote a very long article about it, published just this morning, okay. so it's up there. But uh, basically, you know, this is. You know, this is the this is blockbuster is what this is. This is <laughs> streaming is never going to be a thing. Therefore, we don't have to care about it, and uh, we're going to tell you all that that you need to keep coming in and renting our movies for four twenty five uh, a night, and then if you don't get it back by noon the next day, which you're not gonna, you have to pay an extra day for it. Um, and they went the the way of the the dinosaurs. I think that uh, you know theater. I I think that there will always be a place for for theaters for cinemas mm -hmm. in um, some form I or fashion. Don't, no. Yeah, I don't know that what it looks like now is what it's going to look like right. in the future. And this whole, you know, we must keep the status quo. We must keep things the way they are because that's the best way for us to make money is a compelling enough argument for me to go back to, to the theaters, <laughs> um, especially in this. You know, I mean, there's like we've said it many times before, there's lots of countries that don't have access to vaccines like we do. And then add to the fact that numbers all over, even the countries with vaccinated people are going up because of the Delta variant. Uh, and then saying things like, you know, there are more people with kids that have Disney Plus that stream this stuff. Think of how much money we would have made, which is what they say in here. Think of how much money we would have made if we had gotten all those people to go to the theaters. I'm like, they didn't go to the theaters because their kids are young and you can't get them vaccinated yet. And maybe they're not, <laughs> you just would have lost out anyways. You have no way of knowing, but they're like, oh no, no, we would have made a lot more money if we could have gotten all those people in the theaters. I mean, they're like, going by historical yeah. data, which is MCU movies don't typically drop this much in the second weekend, but it's a data point of one. And Black Widow mm -hmm. was not by any stretch the most highly reviewed movie in the MCU. There's there's a quite a mixed I, reviews going on with it. I, I didn't so. love it. I thought it was fine. I thought it's it was fine. fine. It's better than Iron Man 2. Okay. Definitely. It's better, better than Thor 2, I mm -hmm. thought. Uh... I'm not sure Iron Man 3 sort of I, <laughs> I liked it better than Iron Man 3 because I thought Iron Man 3 was dumber I, I guess if that makes sense I'm like the guy just blew up like yeah, the, the entire world's G of GDP <laughs> of, of Iron Man suits just blew them all up so he could prove he loves Gwyneth Paltrow who didn't, never shows up in the movie again after that but or hardly shows up in the movies after that so I just ugh. I, I mean it, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking this is a movie that would have done really well on its opening weekend and definitely would have fallen off on the second. Yeah. Second weekend. Yeah. And they're saying would it have fell off 67%. Right. I don't know. They're saying it fell off more because of Disney Plus. We don't know that for sure with a data set of one. Uh, but right. even so, I'm like, honestly, I do think where we'll ultimately land is something like what Warner Brothers has worked out for 2022, right? Which is that there will be an exclusive window for theaters of about 30 to 45 days, something in that stretch. And then it will show up on streaming. And I think. I think that's pretty reasonable. I I think that that is probably where we will land. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. I still think that we're going to see some day and date releases. Uh, Maybe I don't know if it, I don't know if they'll end up being smaller movies that will do that, or well, I certainly think biggest that movies. anything that comes out and bombs almost instantly is going to show up on streaming real quick. Right. Because <laughs> why right. spend the marketing dollars twice? Right. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I have a plan for another. And we've talked about this a little bit on this podcast. If we do move towards day and date, we see we're going to see more uh, diffusion, maybe, of income, mm. so that you're not going to see these massive billion dollar numbers, and therefore it's going to be harder for Marvel and everybody else to spend more money mm. on these blockbuster movies. So the movies will end up getting smaller. Uh, so I've, I've got kind of an idea for an article about that as well. So we'll, we'll see what I come up with in the next. But yeah, I just don't think that <laughs> Standing there on your on your porch, yelling at people that they have to go back to theaters no matter what because it's good for everybody, is factual or 
what's actually going to happen. I just think that the that we've been the pandemic has accelerated so many things, including right. you know how we work, how we consume uh, media, how we how we do how we shop, how we go out to eat. All of that stuff has changed because of the pandemic, and some of it will go back to quote unquote normal, but. A lot of it, I think we're going to see some of these changes stay. And mm -hmm. one of those changes is I just don't think people are going to be as willing to go to movie theaters to see, you know, movies as readily as they would uh, before the pandemic. I know people that used to go every weekend. I'm That's right. going to bet that people are going to be like, yeah, I am. Got to Change is why, difficult. Why all right, comments here. Garinder just had to vent his JVC projector is away for a while at the authorized service center, so he figured it would be a perfect time to pick up a 65-inch OLED he's been considering. He's got a couple of different uh, stores just a few minutes from his house, and he was out anyway, so he checked uh, their websites, and they listed some attractive clearance prices on Sony's A8H OLEDs from last year. He went to Best Buy first and was informed that their last A8H just got picked up by a customer, so the in-stock data on the website hadn't updated yet, and now they were out of stock. No problem, he thought. He'd just pop over to the other store a few minutes away. But then when he got there, he literally saw an A8H, which is so much fun to say, being loaded in, into someone's car. And sure enough, that was the last one. <laughs> the LG OLEDs at his local Costco aren't as cheap, so he missed out. Should he take it as a sign? I mean, I would have gotten a rain check while I was there. I mean, that's what I would have yeah. done. I mean, that's what they do, right? If you don't have it in stock, but it's still on sale, you get the rain check. And when they get it back in stock, they <laughs> have to sell it to you for that price. That's what I would do. Sure. But, I mean, maybe you'll take it as a sign. That's up to you. Indeed. Or when you see it in stock on the website, you click uh, curb pickup, and uh, yeah. and wait for them to get back to you and say your your item is ready to pick up, rather than going there in person before knowing that the item is there. Uh, I can understand. I can understand. I of would course. totally do the first. I, I would have totally done the same thing. <laughs> James wrote us back. Uh, or, I'm sorry, wrote us a while back when he, both his Kef subwoofer stopped working at the exact same time, and he wasn't sure if the problem was the subs, his receiver, or something else. We gave him some trouble to shooting suggestions and using those he was able to determine that it was definitely the subwoofers themselves and everything else was fine so he got in touch with kef uk and to his pleasant surprise even though uh he was well out of warranty they repaired his r 400b subs at no cost to him they are both working again and he is extreme don't move the text while i'm trying to read it. <laughs> typo sorry <laughs> and he's extremely happy with Kev's customer service, so he thought they deserved a shout out for making things right. So that's good. Yeah, I mean, always happy. I, I to swear, hear sometimes that. when you when you when you call in these customer service, there, there's a lot to do with your attitude there's when that you too. call. Yeah, but it, there's a lot of luck involved with <laughs> who you end up getting in touch with. Like you get the right person, and everything goes swimmingly uh for example my wife called uh this is when we were in australia and we had some tickets that we needed to change or refund or something um she called and she got somebody on the phone and they said sure this is no problem i can do this right now you know and get it all taken care of and uh and, and my wife was like well let me talk to my husband about it and i'll call you right back so <laughs> she got off the phone. She she talked to me, and I said, "Sure, that sounds great." She called back, and this was Expedia, which is, by the way, we will never use Expedia again, <laughs> or at least she won't, because of this. She it took her literally months of calling and being on hold and getting disconnected and everything mm. else before she could finally get those uh, another person who could get those tickets nah. changed. The first person was like could have totally done it, <laughs> apparently, and but she just could not get it. Could, could not get anybody else to do it. Mm. And, uh, you know, her attitude will say slightly soured as it went <laughs> along. So that wasn't helping things. But, uh, you know, sometimes when, if you get just the right person on the phone, you're like, right. It, I it's mean, it's butter. So I do want to say to anybody, uh, it isn't fair to expect a company to service something free of charge outside of warranty. If they say, right, I'm sorry, the warranty has elapsed. We can we can you know, point you to an authorized repair center, but you will have to pay the charge. That is completely reasonable. Uh, so right. I don't want people to expect that this is the way it should go every single time. But we do recommend KEF quite often around here. We like their speakers. Uh, we like to recommend them for their performance and their price to performance ratio. And it is very nice to hear that, you know, at least one person had very good customer service, went above and beyond, and they were very pleased with that as well. So that's that's a nice story to have. Right. So let's talk about uh, some questions here. Mm -hmm. Jack 
Jack has a home theater set up with appearing Intimus speakers all the way around with the 6T towers and 6C center up front. Bass is handled by a pair of Outlaw LFM1 subs. His room is r- roughly 26 feet wide and 15 feet long. 26 by 15. Okay. Mm-hmm. He wrote to us previously saying how he'd like to upgrade his setup. It made sense to upgrade his Plasma TV and Onkyo 809 receiver first, but we said to audition speakers before committing to any speaker purchases since Appearing Intimus are already pretty good. Well, excuse me. Uh, auditioning has been difficult. He managed to hear some clips and some KLH, but neither of those tickled his fancy. I am unsurprised. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first two I would have gone towards, but maybe that's, that's, that, what, that's what he had access to. Uh, access yeah. to. Yeah, I, I, I great, understand. I'm glad that. he li- actually, in a in a way, I'm very glad that he got to hear those in person because at right. least it tells you that it's not insane to think that there are differences between speakers. Right. <laughs> and right. he he heard it pretty quickly. He's like, yeah, not not neither of those two for him. But he just feels that stereo listening for music is lacking somehow. He wishes he could put it into words, and will. Uh, never believed this, but adding a Parasound amp to f- power his front towers didn't do the trick. <laughs> I am so shocked. Uh-huh. I'm surprised. Why? 15 feet it is helps. the long way he's sitting, so he's probably about 10, 12 feet away if he has a little <laughs> bit of space behind him. Yeah. But it, but amps always add to clarity. That's what they say on the lines, on the online. Channel separation, on Tom. Forms. Channel separation. Channel separation. Everything was bleeding together before I added my external amp. <laughs> And now I, there's a massive gap between my front That's left right. speaker and my front right speaker, which is exactly what you want in stereo imaging. Yep. All right. So he says with local shops and source supply and store demos being so difficult, he's looking uh, to the internet direct brands with uh, SVS and Ascend in consideration. But should he just go straight to Appearance's own higher end models? Would that allow him to keep using his Intimus 6, uh, 6C center without worries about timbre matching? You would know better than me about this because, I mean, at, le- at, le- at this point, he would be going towards the Sierras. Um, if that's a send, you... if he's sticking with a Perian, he'd yeah. be going to either the Novus or the Varus Grand, because uh, those are the the next two series up right. in uh, a Perian's own lineup. But ascents are uh, a t- essentially a fairly flat speaker, anyways. I mean, and, all of uh, these SVS, a Perian, and ascend they all target a pretty darn flat, neutral, linear frequency response. I would be extremely surprised if you paired any of these speakers together with that center channel and thought, oh, well, this is not going to work. Right. Uh, I, I would, I, like I've said, I have heard, I've, ha- I've owned very many uh, flat speakers and I've had to pair them with mm-hmm. other speakers and a flat center channel just kind of goes with everything. It does. Unless the thing you put it with isn't flat or isn't at least attempting to be flat. Right. If it's it, If it has a sound, if it's, somehow uh, coloring slightly the the music or the 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 audio that it's producing it that's when you'll notice the timbre match difference sure. like it's, if he had just I picked up surprised. a pair of clips reference towers and stuck those to the left and right of yeah. his intimus center if he came back and said i can hear a timbre mismatch when a sound pans from left to center to right i would go yeah i believe you i i wholeheartedly believe you um so i mean we'll Will pairing your existing Intimus 6C center from Aperion with SVS or Ascend or one of the higher lineups in Aperion be a perfect timbre match in all scenarios, no matter how critically you listen, you could play pink noise, you know, panning back and forth and you would never be able to tell the difference between speakers. No, I wouldn't go that far. If we're going hypercritical, there could be very small timbre mismatch, but in an overall sense of I'm watching a movie, does it distract me that my center sounds significantly different from my new left, right speakers? Any of these three brands, they're more similar than different. Um, I would say it's very easy for you to audition in both Aperion and SVS because those two companies both offer free two-way shipping. And I'm, I'm like, I'm literally at the point of why not? Why not bring you in... You just have to... You just have to ship them back in time to yeah. before it hits your credit card. But you got 45 days. Interest. You know, you got 45 right. days to send them back and they pay the shipping both ways. If You are not out a single penny if you send the speakers back. So I would, in a heartbeat, 
tell you to bring in a pair of SVS speakers, bring in a pair of Aperion's Varus or Novus, if that's the price point you'd prefer. Uh, and and absolutely, but, you know, take advantage of that free two-way shipping. It's it's there for you to be able to audition in your house. Now, Ascend, I actually think this is one of the questions that you have, but uh, Ascend does not pay the shipping both ways. You pay the shipping right. both ways. That's the next there, question. There is a shipping charge for Ascend and there is a return shipping charge, but you do get a full refund. So uh, there I would probably recommend like bring in a pair of their bookshelves speakers where the shipping cost is not high and if you end up sending them back then yes you are out some money but not a tremendous amount right so second question if you were to go with a, a sen sierra tower mm -hmm. should you get the standard dome tweeter or the raw ribbon tweeter given his room size and does ascend do in home trials well rob just answered that second yeah. part i want to tell you that you shouldn't get towers period i think that I mean, You're his not room far is enough away. his room is big. Yeah, far away, probably not. But in terms of that region where the it's, it's, subs and the towers are crossing over, his room's big enough that there's some play in. If you play your stuff uh, really loud, and I don't know if you do, I don't know. if you play your stuff 15, crazy 15 loud, fifteen by twenty six, you could just yeah. bump the bump the subwoofer up, <laughs> bump the crossover up a little, and increase the subwoofer a little, probably, almost certainly. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Uh, that being said, I. Uh, because you're going, because you're talking about going with, uh, you know, you're tr really trying to get an upgrade. I would mm -hmm. probably go with the raw ribbon tweeters here, even though they're not gonna, the tweeter itself is going to be a different form factor than what you're what you're going to have in your center channel. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that you're still not going to notice a huge amount of difference <laughs> between the two of them. It's getting uh, into the territory where if you are critically listening there, you might be able to hear the difference between the. But you see, I I I think that that critical right. listening is going to be. Yeah, but he's not going to have left, center, right going for the critical music listening. I know, that yeah. He would actually be able to hear. He'd only be left and right anyways, yeah. unless he's going to do some sort of, you know, surround up mixing, mm -hmm. in which case all bets are off anyways. It's all going to sound different. It's than just, it's I, could, to sound. I could envision him getting the Sierra Towers with the Raul, uh Ribbon Tweeter upgrades and... Uh, if nothing else, convincing himself that he now wants a mm -hmm. new center, mm -hmm. I could I could mm -hmm. see that happening quite easily. Uh, there, there. It seemed like I was, uh, you know, inferring when I was reading his email that he was a little bit concerned about the output capabilities. That maybe the ribbon tweeters are more fragile or something like that. Uh, no, with the uh, seventy twenty, uh, the the biggest uh, Ral ribbon tweeter, which is what you'll find in the towers or in the horizon, uh, that can actually handle more power and play slightly louder than the dome tweeter. So if that's your concern, mm -hmm. if you're actually looking for what has the highest output and the highest power handling, it's actually the Ral ribbon tweeter in this case. So there's no concerns about uh, fragility of the ribbon tweeter in terms of output capability and certainly not when 15 feet is the entirely even if you had the the speakers pressed against the front wall and your seat is pressed against the back wall it's somewhat less than 15 feet it's not going to be an issue as far as output yeah. goes um yeah i mean what i'm tempted that to, to honestly just bring in like Aperion's Varus speakers as your first go yeah. simply because if they completely float your boat great you're done if they don't it's free to send them back that's very very easy so yeah. I, I wouldn't necessarily i mean i love the ascend uh Ral towers don't don't get me wrong there but i i wouldn't necessarily go their number one choice in his scenario um and if you ended up with svs ultra or something like that i think that would work really well too so yeah i would bring in a period and svs in a heartbeat right doing that you know like rob said it's got zero downside as yeah. far as as long as you audition them quickly and send them back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. And I mean, you could bring in a single Sierra 2 center to get a taste of what the Sierra Ral speakers uh, sound like. I mean, what I'm meaning is that it's, would be hard. it's very yeah. cheap to send it back uh, as far as right. shipping costs go. I don't know. I think I would bring in. I think I would bring in bookshelves from everybody. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Just do just just do the the raw t ribbons on the sends. Yeah. I would do the ultra ultra bookshelves yeah. and the what, the various, various grand bookshelves. Grand bookshelves. I agree with that. Put them all the, Have a three way the shootout along with your intimus towers. Well, you gotta you gotta you gotta apples to apples. At least you'll yeah. know that you know. And what are you gonna get with a tower speaker? Well, you're gonna get a little bit more bass. And this way, you can all you can sit there and say to yourself, okay. Am I hearing a – with this bookshelf, with whichever – because the Sierras – I mean, the last time I reviewed Sierras, it was a Sierra 1, right. and it was, you know, it was a regular tweeter and everything else, but it had a, just a bunch of bass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, the bass was not much of an issue, so mm -hmm. you may be able to just take one of these, you know, these three speakers and then hook them up, 
listen to them, compare them, yeah. but uh, then also run a sweep that, that goes yes. from 20 kilohertz to 20 hertz and listen to it go through that crossover region yeah. and say to yourself, hey, am I hearing a huge volume drop or a, am I experiencing a, a, a volume suck out mm -hmm. around this area because the crossover area that the, the speaker isn't, isn't able to keep up? Mm -hmm. Can I fix it by bumping up the crossover to 100 hertz? Mm -hmm. Or do I actually need that tower? Because then you're not, now you're looking at, not only am I safe, say you like this in the sense not only are you saving money on not buying a tower you are also saving money on not having to send it back that's right <laughs> and then pay for <laughs> pay for the pay for the the tower to be shipped to you so uh i mean that's the way i would do it if, if i were in your position those were the sp three speakers i would look at um you know if i had to add more to this i would say the kefs sure uh you know there's they've got some offerings in there i would look at oh uh, yeah they're the R50s or whatever they are, or LS50s. Yeah, well, yeah, the uh, LS50s, yeah, although... They're a lot more expensive, though. Yeah, they're a lot more I might suspect that LS50s, they they might struggle a wee little bit in that crossover region. Yes. They aren't super loud and they aren't super bass heavy, uh, but yeah, certainly right. something in the R series would be uh, would be in there, and KEF is widely available in stores, so that's that's one that there's a, a likelihood you might have a store uh, somewhat local to you that, that would carry them, and there's also, you can shop KEF Direct, uh, where, again, right. you won't get free shipping both ways but you can buy direct from kev right um but you can some you can buy them from amazon and if you, that's right you know, amazon a lot of times will give you free returns mm -hmm. and shipping and stuff like that so uh you also consider going there i guess on amazon too there's you know the monitor audio is on there i know for sure um dolly has some offerings but not mm. many so there's some things you no, can i like the that. idea of a bookshelf speaker shootout for you I think so too. So his goal is a better stereo and music experience, although he can't specifically say what he is after. So what do we advise? Uh, I mean, first of all, have, uh, do we know if he's treated his room? I I don't. I, I think he did say it in a previous email, but I didn't look back through all of Jack's previous That's emails, fine. so I don't. I don't know for certain. I mean, one thing I would say is if you do this bookshelf speaker shootout and you still don't hear any kind of appreciable improvement and and it's still not getting you anything uh that that is sort of satisfying even though you can't really put into words exactly what you're listening for uh nothing mm. comes close out of those like out of svs ultra hyperion varus grand and ascend sierra ral if none of those are giving you any kind of upgrade i would strongly suggest that that your speakers are not the weakest link in the chain that would indicate to me pretty quickly that room acoustics are are almost certainly the number one candidate at that point that needs to be improved to uh cure whatever is ailing you right now in your in your sense of just not well, quite being at the audio quality that you want to be i i've said this a couple of times and i i think it stands up uh well i think it stands up uh if you are thinking of buying new speakers and you have not treated your room or right. addressed the, your room acoustics as much as you can, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you've got to make it into an anechoic chamber. I'm not saying that you know, you've got to get a bunch of printed panels and do a bunch of stuff. I'm saying as much as you're going to treat your room, as much as mm -hmm. you're capable because of whatever reasons, if you haven't done that before you go shopping for your speakers, mm -hmm. then you're... You're you're absolutely hamstringing yourself. You know, <laughs> why bring in say, all these speakers? Yeah. I, well, why bring in all these speakers and then just to find out in the end you're like, I don't know, they all sound they all sound kind of the same amount of crappy. Uh, well, that's probably your room. That the, yeah. your room is overriding how good those speakers can be. But when you're having uh, trouble identifying, I think there is some value there because I, another thing we've said and we stand by this with. With those three examples that we've mentioned now, SVS Ultra, and I mean, this would go for Kef R series too, um, mm -hmm. you know, Aperion Varus Grand, Ascensia Oral, those are all, I mean, do they sound literally identical? No, but they're all of the sort of quality level where if you don't like what you're hearing, we wouldn't blame the speakers in, in all right. of those cases. And so when you are having a real tough time identifying and... Sometimes it is just plain easier to bring in a pair of bookshelf speakers and listen to that than it is to, in, you know, acoustically treat your entire room. I, I completely see value when you're trying right. to discern what, okay, what is it? What is it that's holding me back? I don't know. I think having that tool of a speaker like, you know, these any of these really good bookshelf speakers and saying, I'm pretty darn certain that if I'm not completely satisfied with what I'm hearing, it's not the speaker's fault. I know that now. So I, I think there's value in going that direction, and and possibly it's it's uh, easier and costs less in the long run. 
that that has value i mean so let's put it this way what would i do if i if i decided i wanted new speakers what would i do to make sure that before i ever ordered the speaker i knew that i needed new speakers if right. that makes sense yeah i the first thing i would do is look at the room and make sure i've done everything i, mm. I i'm willing to do to it um i would rerun my my room correction making sure after I've having done that. treated the room as much as you're after having treated able. the room yeah. Uh, and then I would play with positioning. And there's that too. Uh, there's quite a bit there that, you know, people have absolute, I mean, I, I cannot tell you how many times on Reddit people are complaining about, you know, their speakers and their <laughs> clips and they're pointed directly at their heads. Mm -hmm. I mean, and tower speakers from five feet away pointed directly. They're like, things sound a little bright. I'm like, yeah, think you think they do. <laughs> but I mean, you and I are also coming from, a, a, a depth and a, a length of time of experience where where we're we feel confident in uh predicting what it is that's that's causing whatever it is that we're hearing whereas if you don't have that frame of reference if you don't have that knowledge base i think having a basically a tool you know like a speaker that you can be pretty darn sure right. is not the problem regardless of the scenario yeah i i see that there i i think yeah anyway but we've made our our counter arguments and uh and jack can Make of that what he pleases. <laughs> right. So so you've got, you treat the room, you you run your room correction, and if you've already treated your room, you run the room correction again right. just to make sure. Uh, you adjust the positioning and you, you adjust, you, you look at all that, and then you bring in the new speakers. Mm. And if at the end of that, if you brought in speakers that your research has told you, these should sound better right. on some level than what I currently have, and, it, and you end up at, at a place where you're like, they, they sound the same. Or they even sound worse somehow, which can happen. You say you've got a more entry level speaker has a roll off at the top end. You know it's a little non linear throughout the the frequency range. But in your room it sounds kind of okay. But you want an upgrade. You get the speakers that are better. Well, the speakers that are better are flatter. They extend higher, and they're activating maybe even more mm. room modes than you had before. So if your room is bad. A bad speaker might just accidentally work well <laughs> True. in yeah. your in your uh, in your room, and if that's the case, you're like, okay, well, now I know that getting better speakers won't make things sound better in here. Mm. Which means, unless I can fix everything else, mm. the room, the treatments, the positioning, whatever, if I can't fix all that, well, then there's no point spending money on more on different better speakers right now, yeah. and instead, I'll focus on. You know, upgrading my display, upgrading my sources, upgrade, you know, upgrading my room, hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, you know, work for the next five years of slowly convincing your wife through subliminal noises in the bedroom while she's sleeping, a <laughs> little put headphones on her. You want to put room treatments up? You know, I mean, that sort of thing. So that's sort of where I would go with uh with this, because you really can get, and it's it's counterintuitive. You can take really great speakers and put them in a really bad room, mm. and they're going to sound really bad. Oh, yes. And pe people are like, "I don't. That shouldn't be the case." It is. It is absolutely <laughs> the case. Brett. Brett says he is so happy with his home theater performance. So naturally, he's wondering if he needs to upgrade. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how it goes in the home theater community. This, this is why, after you get your home theater perfect, you stop reading the internet. <laughs> Don't Never. look at anything else. So, okay, cycling. I've been cycling a lot lately. <laughs> we with, have so uh, many questions. Tom. I don't care. So far behind. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're cycling with this guy, and we're talking about how how bikers are like gear fanatics. Like they'll read the latest thing that comes out, and they're like, "I have to have this new, you know, carbon fiber, you know, seat post or something. I have to have this, blah blah blah, because it's going to make me faster." And you're like, "You're you're overweight and." You cycle once a month. You're not going to get any faster by buying aerodynamic bars. This is the same thing in home theater. The home theater is the same way. You're like, you like you sit around. You're like everything's perfect. How can I buy more <laughs> stuff to make it better? So, anyways, he already has a pair of SVS SB13 Ultra subs handling the base. The volume on that can go up from one to a hundred. He's at about fifteen. <laughs> so you know, a little bit of headroom. Doesn't seem like he needs more power, but SVS is offering those thirteen Ultra to four thousand series amplifier upgrade kits are $400 each so looking at almost a thousand dollars to spend that would let him uh use the app to control the subs and right now even though his 13 ultra subs are di nicely dialed in if he were to make any changes he'd have he'd have to take four whole steps to walk over one of them 
So yeah, that's, they're thirteen ultra subs. Uh, they they're ESPYs though. They're the SPs, sealed boxes. Yep. Okay. Anyways, so the benefit of the app control is obvious. Oh, that's he says, right. But could could he justify the amplifier upgrade kit for any performance reasons? I could say no. I really I could say hell no. I could say, have you lost your dang mind? I really okay. wish I could say a flat no, except I know from experience that they did tune the DSP for the sealed modes a little differently in the 4000 amplifier oh my upgrade God. kits. Do not encourage this, Rob. This is, it, is, he's not going to notice it. It is It is like in an anechoic chamber, flatter to down to 20 hertz with i mean now and that's, the, like your room the anechoic chamber is what you call your home theater and, right? and also clearly you have headroom available to where you could apply just the slightest bit of eq on the very bottom end of your existing sp13 ultras and very easily get to the exact same response that the 4000 series sub has out of the box so it's not as though you don't have the capability of making them sound identical uh so in that sense uh i will say no this is not the best expenditure of your $800. Um, there is some convenience. There's no question there is some convenience to be had. But unless you are going to be frequently adjusting and changing the settings of your subwoofer, I mean, that's the thing. this right? is a one-time adjustment that needs to be done. And I can't say this is where you should spend $800. I, mean, I, just, just, I just don't. Every part of every fiber of my <laughs> very very cheap being goes eight hundred dollars yeah. just so that you can say you have app control that you literally never use. Mm -hmm. you know, it seems seems gratuitous. <laughs> Right, he's got uh, Send Sierra 2 speakers. He's really happy with them, but the Send offers the Sierra 2, the Sierra 2 EX upgrade <laughs> kits, which are again about four hundred bucks, three hundred sixty eight dollars each. Mm -hmm. Would those take his his sound quality to the next level? Now, that's a Rob question. Sure. Well, I have to uh, do a little bit of sleuthing here, which is that he said with a pair of SB13 Ultra subs, he has them set to about 15. So that tells me I don't think he's in a huge room. Uh, sure. And if you are not in a huge room, then there is no chance that you are sitting very far away. It also indicates that you do not need tremendous bass output from your speakers in the right. crossover region. Because if you're is that what the EX means? The EX means extended bass? Very largely what you're getting with the Sierra 2 EX is deeper, louder bass capability. Now, there is some little bit of change that happens in the mid-range because in the Sierra 2, the Rowl Ribbon Tweeter in that bookshelf model does not play particularly low. It only comes down to about uh, in the 3,000 to 3,500 hertz range. That's higher than where a lot of tweeters cross over the mid-range drivers. So the mid-range driver is responsible in the Sierra 2 EX for a lot of the detail in the human voice. So it is a different woofer in the Sierra 2 EX. That is essentially what's changing is the woofer and the cross over uh, components. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you're hypercritically listening, can you detect some differences between the original Sierra 2 and the Sierra 2 EX in the mid-range? I mean, people will claim up and down all, the, all day that they can, but objectively what you will notice most is deeper, louder bass from the Sierra 2 EX. And you absolutely, by all indications of what, the way you've said do you set up your subs, any additional do bass not in this room. need that. Yeah, <laughs> The tweeters are identical. There is nothing, no difference to be had in the treble between the 2 and the 2 EX. Uh, so I really don't think you need to spend your um what is it 775 dollars or so uh on that either i know you you got apparently about 800 bucks burning a hole in your pocket it sounds like right and you want to do something uh you know what i would do if i were him i would just or i would just go to Perian and svs and order some of their you know top of the line speakers oh, okay and have a little an shootout <laughs> Have a little shootout. You know, this will give you something to do. You'll feel like you spent money, and then you'll send it back, and you won't have spent any yeah. money. And if you find out that you like them, well, then you have something to spend money on. That's right. I, I, I think that's what I would do. And I do think uh, if you don't already have uh, some kind of Plex setup or something like that, then maybe that's where the money goes. It goes into some NAS drives and a and or room Shield treatments. Pro. If he hasn't done or, enough of that, I mean, yeah, I would do yeah. more room. It sounded treatments like he has, but uh, yeah, some, yeah. Sometimes when you got a hole burning, uh, 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 money burning a hole in your pocket, and you want to spend it on something, that uh, that homemade movie server can be a nice way Seating. to go. Maybe you go with a Zapiti, which is which is quite easy. To use ad storage. He could do seating. seating. He could he yeah. could get some upgraded seats that that's right. auto recline and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, I mean that's more than eight hundred bucks, but you know clearly you have sixteen hundred if you were planning on doing both. <laughs> ben in Perth, Australia, say hi to Perth for me, man. I missed that place. 
Uh, ben has a small room, approximately 12 by 12 by 8. It's dedicated to being a home theater, and he sits about 8 feet from his... Uh, th- I'm sorry. I got, it threw me off that there was another 8 in there. I was like, nah. he's sitting on the back wall? No, nope. he's not sitting on the ceiling, Tom. No, no, no. <laughs> it's dedicated to being a home theater, and he sits about 8 feet from his front three speakers. He started out with a Yamaha speaker package that included the NS F51 towers, which have dual 6.5-inch woofers. Mm-hmm. The NS... Uh, P551 center and surrounds with four inch woofers and the Yamaha sub. So let's not call it a sub. It's almost <laughs> certainly not a sub, but it might be. <laughs> Once he had a, uh, an Atmos capable receiver, the Yamaha RX V685, he added a pair of PBS, uh, PSBs, Imagine XA upward fire, firing Atmos modules, and he recently replaced the Yamaha sub with a pair of SVS SB1000 Pros. So he's on. He definitely has subs now. Oh yes. Along his home theater journey, he learned about acoustic treatments, proper speaker placement, and calibration. So he's addressed those sorts of things. And now, the new dual subwoofers have really improved his bass and made a big difference. So is it finally time to upgrade the speakers? He's very pleased with pleased with the SVS subs. So he's strongly considering the SVS Prime series speakers. He was thinking they might go with the Prime Towers and Prime Center up front with Prime satellites uh, for surrounds. The PSB Atmos modules would stay for now. Uh, so if he went with that setup, would his Yamaha receiver be sufficient to power? First of all, yes. Okay, let's yes. talk about twelve let's, foot let's by twelve talk foot about room. All of this. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is a twelve by twelve by eight. You don't need towers. Number one. Yeah. You could probably get, you could probably get around with satellites all the way around this bad boy. Oh, but you definitely I'm not could. Output say that. wise, yes. <laughs> Output wise, you could. I the prime center and bookshelves with mm-hmm. satellite surrounds is perfect in yep. this room you don't need any and no tower stop it with the towers <laughs> yeah everybody you're... stop it with the towers towers already. might I'm... legitimately be a detriment in this i room. think so from only eight I feet away agree. and the whole room is only 12 by 12 i think they can legitimately be a detriment in here yeah i agree yeah so uh, powering these things in this room at like ridiculous volumes you need about 25 watts maybe like man yeah i you think know? even that would be overshooting it <laughs> that's giving you lots of headroom oh, yeah. so uh there's literally no receiver on the market that would have a problem with this <laughs> right, five yeah. point one point and sps prime series speakers four. are yeah. not difficult to drive in any no sense. they're not no. no no so do we think those are the right speakers for an upgrade that we just told you what they were yeah, right. will he hear a big difference on what he has now i would think so I would think that this would be a, a situation where not only b- between the the quality of the drivers and mm-hmm. how the speakers are designed and everything else, but going from the bookshelf to <laughs> from the tower to the bookshelf, I think will also make a big difference right. because I you know these type and these are not you know cheap speakers. I mean they're like they're a thousand of ninety oh, ninety yeah, fifty yeah. a pair. I mean I, I mean, would these are not. I, I would venture to say that the um, you'll really hear a difference in the center because the the Yamaha center that you're using right now. Yeah. I mean it's not it's by no means the worst speaker in the world or anything like that, but uh, the Prime Center from SVS, that is that is just a straight-up good speaker and a significant right. upgrade over your current Yamaha Center. If, if there were anything where I would be shocked that you didn't hear a very noticeable upgrade, it would be the center speaker. And then having perfectly matching speakers all around to complement it uh, is just the cherry on top. Yeah. Uh so he says, what are some alternatives that that are around the same price point as SVS Prime series? And keeping um, in mind, this is Australia, so he doesn't have Australia, the right. free shipping Apirian option. You know, Ascend will ship right. to Australia, but there is a, a fairly hefty shipping cost involved with that. So stuff that is more readily available in Australia would be easier to deal with. Like, it's been years since I've been there. It's like seven years since right. I've lived there. But, you know, what I always... I would walk in like West Coast Electronics or whatever it's called, okay. West Coast AV, whatever the name of that 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 company is, and they always had like a shelf of mm-hmm. return stuff, and that's what I would do if I were in your situation. Okay. I would look at that. They usually have dollies. Yeah. Uh, it's very readily available over there. Um, I honestly, I, I don't know what the prices are for mm-hmm. SVSs in Australia, mm. but everything in Australia is really expensive. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. really and expensive. And especially so, the, looking at the US dollar versus the Australian dollar price, it's right. there's an even bigger gap there. I would be shocked if you can find something that is going to be as readily available and sound as good as mm. the SVS Prime I mean, Kef Q Australia. series, because Kef is worldwide. Yeah. Uh, so I think you'd probably be able to find some Kef Q series at, at something resembling that price. Also, Q Acoustics should be available. Right. I always forget about them. Yeah, that, 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 that would I, be another I, I one. Yeah, I didn't see them while I was there, but 
I, I the ones I noticed were the dollies, and there were uh, right. like icons and some other ones, and you know the. Some yeah, if you're if you're, if you're looking to do a little bookshelf speaker shootout in Australia, uh, then yeah, Dolly, Kef Q series, Q Acoustics, and SVS. Absolutely, I would include SVS in that shootout, and I think that'll right. give you a really nice taste of what's in that sort of price range. Yeah, like we said, we don't actually know what the prices are. We're yeah, just yeah, assuming yeah. there'll be something there that is be comparable. If the SVS is all like the most expensive of the entire group, it might that be. Could, that could be the case. We don't yeah. know. Uh, but if they're around all around the same price, mm-hmm. we know the SVSs will give you a good, a, oh, yeah. a good sound. And over the Q series, I would, you know, I've listened, I've heard some Q speakers before. I would lean towards SVS, my okay. personal preference, but uh, you know, you may, may find it different. And in this mm-hmm. room, I mean, yeah. you're not pushing any speaker to the right. breaking point. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> You're not going to be Long, clipping anything. Yeah, so you really have every option open to you. <laughs> Mark, who says he's a longtime listener. Uh, last week, li- lightning struck a neighbor's tree. That neighbor suffered some damage to several electrical devices in his house. There's a uh, distance between the two houses, so Mark didn't anticipate having any problems of his own, but he discovered that he wasn't getting any image on his projector. He did some troubleshooting and found that the HDMI 1 input on his uh projector wasn't working anymore but hdmi input 2 seems to be okay his av receiver isn't out at putting any video though so not even its setup menu sound is still working but its video output seems to be shot his projector was plugged straight into an outlet no surge protection we do not recommend that <laughs> uh this all uh, coincides with the lightning strike but is it, it but is that just a coincidence how could lightning that hits his neighbor's tree and fry some gear inside his neighbor's house also make it all the way over to Mark's house and specifically fry just his uh, it receiver's HDMI output and one HDMI input on his, on his projector? Well, electricity is funny, man. It does all <laughs> kinds of stuff. Let's, let's just it start also with that. travels literally at the speed of light or, or yeah. very, very close to it. Right. Um, uh, the distance between your houses is negligible for light. <laughs> and <Right>. electricity. <laughs> well, and, and you can almost kind of trace the path here. It goes in through the projector's HDMI input, goes down to your receiver's you know, uh, HDMI input, and fries both of those. And then at sure. that point, it loses its ability to kill things. Yeah, um, or, or it gets sufficiently grounded from, from the right. receiver's grounding pin or whatever it is. I mean, right. the, what, the thing is, I would suspect that your neighbor's house and your house were likely built similarly that's that's typical right. in most neighborhoods um and if if lightning is frying things when it strikes now look even if your house is perfectly grounded as as well as it possibly can be a direct lightning strike will still fry things in your house right. um but there are certainly stranger and less common things than houses that were built together at a certain period of time that did not have perfect grounding applied to to everything that's going on there. And if a bunch of stuff got fried in your neighbor's house, probably indicates that, that his house was not perfectly grounded. Um which means that your house probably isn't either. Because, uh, I mean, that that's your number one protection, is proper grounding, <laughs> proper uh, up-to-code uh, municipal grounding of your house. That's your number one protection from a, a literal lightning strike. Uh, whether a surge protection um, you know, device, a, a surge strip on your electrical outlet would have done anything. It'll try to sacrifice itself, but whether that even would have protected things, is that's questionable. So the... True answer is it absolutely a lightning strike of your neighbor's tree could definitely <laughs> make it to your yes. house. That is even through the, just the power lines too. If it's oh, in your sure. if it's if it's in your neighbor's house and you're on the same power grid, which you should be, yeah, it can just it just travels in and it find, finds the path of least resistance. Yeah. You know, and it's it's just like water. It's yeah. going to come in. Yeah. yeah. So that that is no shock at all. Uh, pun not <laughs> entirely intended. Shock. A little bit, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And then, yeah, you know, assuming that if you had had a surge protector, that that would have fixed this thing. Not necessarily. What you, I mean, unfortunately, it's the most expensive uh, thing that you could possibly do in this scenario. But what you would want to do is bring an electrician in and see, make sure that your house is properly grounded because that seems to be the real culprit here. Right. Uh, yeah. And you definitely should have some sort of surge protection on there. Oh, yeah. Including the projector. You know, plus, if you have a projector, if you, 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 he obviously doesn't have battery backup. So, that's right. You know, that's also an issue. And I so. mean, in a way, 
uh, clearly whatever search did make it to your house was pretty low power because HDMI fries easily, unfortunately. Oh, right. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And it it's, sounds like it's quite delicate. That that's that's all that that got fried was one HDMI output. Clearly, the HDMI uh, input on his projector that his HDMI cable was plugged into, and then that made its way to the uh, AV receiver and fried the HDMI board in the AV receiver. And that that can happen darn easily. That can happen with a lot less than a lightning strike. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Justin. Justin is trying to advise his brother on which in-wall or on-wall speakers to choose. He wants to install a 5.2.4 system in a large open concept space with lots of large windows and hardwood floors. A tall order, but he has a very healthy budget. Okay, so it's a big room, open concept, 5.2.4. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin's brother is used to Klipsch speakers and also enjoys Justin's JTR setup that he used to have, but when it comes to in-walls or on-walls and contending with his open room, Justin isn't sure what he should recommend. He's built, uh, Justin has built three dedicated theaters on, of his own, and he tends to work acoustic treatments into this brother's room somehow. Thankfully, the subwoofer can be regular in room subs, but the speakers have to look really slick or invisible, so regular towers or bookshelves are out. He's looked a bit at Legacy Audio, which is almost exactly where I would have put mm -hmm. <laughs> pointed you because they are on wall and they are loud. <laughs> Martin Logan and Wisdom Audio. I don't remember Wisdom. He doesn't think it it will be vital for overhead speakers to match, but he's familiar with the offerings from Martin Logan, JBL, RBH for in-ceilings. So for the five main speakers, what we suggest, price isn't really a limitation in this case, but they've got to have lots of output, be able to contend with this open space, and hopefully have outstanding audio quality were our thoughts. I mean, I really like the legacy audio. Uh, the legacy audio silhouettes, that's which where um, I would go. That they are an interesting <laughs> big, design. Though. They are they are big, um, but they're quite nice looking. And once you have the grills on them, uh, but they yeah they they are not small, and they are also not in wall. Although there is a legacy silhouette pro version, which is actually costs a bit less because it doesn't have as fancy a finish. And the Legacy Silhouette Pro is just a plain black box, which can be recessed all the way into the wall so that it is mm -hmm. essentially an in-wall design. The regular uh, consumer version of the Legacy Silhouette is a hybrid in-wall, on-wall. Part of it needs to be recessed into the wall, but then a significant portion of it is still uh, proud of the wall's surface and, and looks like an on-wall. So the regular Which silhouette... you're going to need to know where your studs are for sure in this Definitely, case. yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in all of these cases, except for one that I'm going to suggest, uh, you need to make sure that the, the stud layout is actually going to work for these. But yeah, those are $2,400 each are the legacy silhouettes, so that's the sort of price point that Justin was basically starting with. Um... Yeah, I mean, certainly sound quality wise, output capability and and uh, and uh, amplifier power handling wise, they will have no trouble with just about any room. Uh, they do have that folded ribbon tweeter, so that gives you some controlled dispersion, at least in the vertical. It has nice wide horizontal dispersion, but some controlled dispersion in the vertical, plus the woofer layout on the uh, Legacy Audio silhouettes further controls the vertical dispersion. So that might be a help in a in a somewhat not fully treated open reflective space. So. Yeah, that is certainly one to consider. Um, that said, one of my first thoughts was to go with Focal. Uh, Focal in their new 1000 series, these are using the same drivers as their uh, Kanta and uh, Utopia series. So it's the Beryllium tweeter in there, their W sandwich cone drivers, uh, so their highest end drivers. One of the things I really, really like about Focal's uh, 1000 series is that it comes in a sealed enclosure, uh, which the legacy uh, silhouettes do as well. So this is actually one where they uh, sell separately, um, sort of like a frame, basically, to turn it into an on-wall. So this can be installed in wall or on wall. Uh, you just have to get the optional frames that make them look like an on wall speaker, and then they come already with uh, with the uh, sealed back enclosure on them. So I really like that. The sound quality is top notch uh, with that driver complement. If you're going for the uh, tweeter above a mid range driver, which can be rotated so that it can be used horizontally or vertically, uh, and then flanked by a pair of woofers, actually one of which is a, a passive radiator in this design. So that's the I. W LCR6. Those go for $2,700 each from Focal. So they're even a little bit more expensive than the Legacy um, Silhouettes. Uh, and then something that is uh, similar to the uh, Pixel from uh, Legacy Audio, because the Legacy Audio has the smaller Pixel on wall. Uh, they have the IW6 in that 1000 series. Those go for $1,800 each. Uh, yeah, 
another one that I always think of for in walls is Kef. Um, and there, if you're looking in their THX series, they have both a Kef R and a Kef reference. The Kef reference is really expensive, eight thousand dollars plus each for the Kef reference uh, THX in walls. But the Kef R series in walls, um, the one I would probably point you to is the CI thirty one sixty. That's two thousand dollars each. Uh, but it definitely is an in-wall, and that is not including the price of Kef's backer boxes. You could build your own, uh, but it is a, a separate charge to get Kef's backer boxes, which I would definitely recommend. They have an even larger one, uh, the CI-5160. Those are $3,000 each. Those have four woofers in addition to the concentric mid-range driver and tweeter in there. Uh, but but those are one. Kef, Kef is always one I consider for... Uh, for really good quality in wall stuff. And then uh, beyond legacy, RBH, of course. You did mention RBH, you're already familiar with them for in ceilings, and they have their signature reference series. You can go all the way up to the signature reference series because uh, the SI760 uh, slash R for the reference version, that's the uh, ribbon, folded ribbon tweeter, and the dual woofer design uh, with the enclosed backer box included. Those are $2,500 each. Uh, but that's with the enclosure. So they're right about the same price as the Kef THX R series. Uh, so any of those, I would I would be very happy considering any of those. Myself, for my my personal taste, I lean I lean towards the Focals. I really, really like those Focals. And I love that you can choose whether they're in wall or on wall. You can mix and match mm. with the very same speaker. Okay. Bob. Bob recently upgraded uh, his... From the older NVIDIA Shield to the newest version, mm -hmm. he can output Dolby Vision from the new Shield. He never saw Dolby Vision as an option on the older Shield. Did he just overlook it or configure something wrong? You did not. There. The older yeah. Shield did not support Dolby Vision, full stop. But the new one does. So that, that was that. <laughs> Uh, he's using a Denon X4300H receiver, which is the same thing I have. And when he plays something, mm, don't it you have is, a 44? dude. I do not. I have looked no. at it recently. It's 43. Oh, okay. <laughs> you keep correcting me, but I am telling you I, it is I, a 43. That was my genuine belief. All right. I know. Now I know. It is not. Okay. It is a 43. And when he plays something in Dolby Vision from the new Shield, uh, his receiver's audio overlays don't show up anymore. So video he can't overlays. see. Video, I'm sorry, video overlays don't show up anymore, so he can't see volume changes in his receiver's info. It still works fine for st a standard dynamic range content. Is it just Dolby Vision where the receiver overlays don't seem to work? Is that expected? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, so it's 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 not entirely unexpected. <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent certain, but it's not surprising because um, in the little bit older receiver models, like with my Marantz SR7010, when you are actually sending the twelve bit, the full fat twelve bit Dolby Vision signal, my Marantz SR7010 has difficulties passing that through. Just just full stop difficulty passing that through. Uh, but if it does, yeah, getting like your video overlays and that, that, that is one thing that that uh, definitely might disappear. So I, I certainly wouldn't be like, oh, there's clearly something wrong with my X4300H. Like, as you say, when you go back to standard dynamic range, it wor it's working just fine. It seems to be specifically Dolby Vision and the NVIDIA Shield. There is no way to have it output Dolby Vision without it sending it as the 12-bit version. It will not send the 10-bit version of Dolby Vision. It just won't do it on the NVIDIA Shield. It will always send 12-bit. So this is not shocking. Um, I definitely don't think there's anything wrong with your Denon. As long as the Dolby Vision signal, the movie itself, is still making it through, you're doing better than my Marantz SR7010 does. <laughs> so I'd say the, uh, getting the video overlay of seeing what the volume is uh, would be gravy, uh, at that point, because you you can live without it, it's just a a little inconvenience, and I I understand, but uh, things seem to be working the way they should. Hmm. Jim Jim has a 55 inch LG B6 OLED and a 65 inch LG B8 OLED. On both of them, he uses the ISF Expert, which is dark room picture mode as a starting point. He has low light levels in both rooms. And he used the Disney's WoW Blu-ray and AVS Forum's Rec. 709 images to adjust the picture settings. The two TVs look very, very close to one another, and he's happy with the way SDR content looks. But he doesn't have any HDR test patterns, and he doesn't have an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. His HDR sources are mainly the apps built into the TV. So he left the TVs in whatever picture mode they automatically switched to for HDR contact after you selected the ISF expert uh, mode as the SDR picture mode. He figures that 
darkroom HDR or something to that. It must be that, something to that effect. <laughs> and in the absence of having any HDR test patterns, he just plugged in the same values as what he uses for SDR. That means the OLED light setting is at 80 for both SDR and HDR. He's concerned that setting it to 100 for HDR might result in burn-in. But HDR doesn't seem to look much different from SDR with the settings this way. So what should he change is the simple as setting the OLED light to 100 for HDR. Yeah, I'm figure this is all completely wrong but i don't know go ahead Rob. right so um first of all having your oled light set to 80 for sdr is way too high <laughs> mm. and i can certainly understand I it was like supposed to be 40 or 30 or something like that yeah well i mean if you're actually going for a complete accuracy which is that sdr technically is supposed to top out at 100 nits uh most people most calibrators agree to setting sdr to 120 nits because there is above white information in sdr but it actually contains genuine detail that that is nice to see so if you set your sdr television to output 120 nits you are getting everything that sdr is supposed to technically show you. And on the LG OLEDs, from year to year, it varies a little bit on exactly what the OLED light setting should be to get you 100 or 120 nits, but it's generally in the range of about 15. It's it's right around there on that OLED light setting wow, to get you down way, to way high. to get you down to 100. It's certainly under 20, right? Usually 20 will be about 140 nits or so, uh, like that. So having it up at 80, your SDR is well brighter than what the technical specification should be. Now, thinking that that is just subjectively more pleasing to your eye makes all the sense because a lot of people prefer it when the image looks brighter and higher in contrast as a result and all that. But on a technical level, that OLED light setting for SDR is much too high. Now, when it switches over to HDR, for HDR10, it should be in just the standard cinema picture mode. That That's what the picture mode should say. When the LG OLED goes to HDR10, it should just be cinema. There is also cinema home. Cinema home is technically not as accurate. It brightens up the shadows too much. Now that's there because if you're in a well-lit room trying to watch HDR10, cinema, which is the most accurate, looks too dark. You lose shadow detail in a well-lit room. So they have the cinema home picture mode there for you if you're in a well-lit room just to brighten the shadows essentially. And that that's fine. That makes sense. But if you're in a dim, dark room, then cinema is the mode that you should use. And the HDR uh, OLED light setting should remain at 100 which is the default. It is not going to result in burn-in. That is there to set the maximum peak, small little highlight uh, output that, that is possible from that television. It does not work the way the OLED light setting works in standard dynamic range anymore. By lowering it, all you're doing is reducing how bright the smallest little highlight can possibly be, and you've capped it at the same brightness as, 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 as SDR in your case. And in your case, SDR was too bright to begin with. So um, that is certainly a setting. Uh, I, I would actually go ahead and just uh, do the reset of the cinema picture mode for HDR10. I would just do the reset inside of the picture mode and get it back to defaults. Now, I actually went through, I, I posted a, a write-up on AV Rent. This is going back years now because I had a C7. Uh, but I wrote up the settings that would apply to the year prior and the next year. So even though mine's the one in between your two model years, uh, if you read through my descriptions of the settings, that you can apply it to your six and you can apply it to your eight. And the settings that I wrote up will work. So if you search for AV Rant Rob's OLED settings, uh, you'll find that in uh, Google. Or, of course, we'll have a link for that in the show notes. And you can follow along in there because it isn't quite as dead simple as just having the OLED light at 100 for HDR and not not changing anything else. There's a few little quirks with some of the color um, and the color space setting and things like that, but I've written it all up so you can follow along in my write-up rather than me literally speaking it all out loud. Uh, Dolby Vision has a few little quirks in it too. Again, there's like Dolby Vision... Uh, uh, what do they even call it? Dolby Vision Cinema and Dolby Vision Home, I think, are the two names. And similar thing there. The home just brightens up the shadows for a well-lit room. Uh, so yeah, so that'll get you on track. These were the years back here in the six and the seven years where uh, artings, ratings, settings, I did not agree with. <laughs> in, in recent times, they've learned and they've gotten much better. And now I agree with their settings on like the, the CX and the C1. I think they're spot on. But back then, uh, I thought that art settings were unreliable enough that I wrote them up myself. <laughs> mm. 
All right, Steve. Steve just got a new Denon X3700H receiver. He's using two of his HDMI outputs to connect to both the TCL 4K TV and the BenQ HT2550 projector, so both displays can accept 4K HDR10 signal. His main sources are NVIDIA Shield Pro and his Bell Satellite TV box. He, he must says be in he... Canada. <laughs> he must be. Mm -hmm. He says he bought two premium active HDMI cables. The, mm -hmm. uh, the one going to his projector is 20 feet long. He's getting HDMI handshake issues, he says. If he cycles the power on his Denon uh, multiple times, it eventually connects. <laughs> but the most reliable way to get the picture on his projector working is to unplug the HDMI cable going to his TV. He contacted Denon, but after going through basic troubleshooting, they said it's all normal behavior and there isn't thing to be done about it. He didn't have these problems with the Onkyo receiver he replaced. Is there some setting in the Denon he can change so that he doesn't have these handshake issues? So we know the other one's 20 feet long. I guess the one to going... the TV we're assuming is shorter, but I, shorter? I did want to mention... Um, Unfortunately, it isn't completely out of the question that the cables themselves are somewhat involved because there is no such thing as a premium high-speed certified active HDMI cable. And he definitely put active in his email. And so right. if it was labeled or marketed as premium active or something like that, that's not official. There is no yeah. such thing as an active HDMI cable that is premium high speed certified that has the hologram and the QR code and all that stuff. Right. So right, right, there's right. a chance that an actual premium certified high speed HDMI cable might do better because certainly if power cycling and that gets it working eventually it sounds like you're right on the border that's what i think too. of the bandwidth and issue if it's not a certified cable if it's yeah you know, it, you know we don't know what the qual the q the quality control the qc right. on and it is sometimes Even though it's shorter it might not be it, 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 it that doesn't necessarily indicate that it's going to have an easier time if the cable right. is you know has a uh, not great tolerances. Yeah, and sometimes if you're like buying on Amazon, say, it, it'll be the same brand and the same series of HDMI cable, but they, they give you the various lengths. And like right. the six foot length is premium high speed certified, but the 15 and 20 foot lengths aren't, but they don't change that in the title on Amazon, do they, right? So it, sometimes it's that type of thing. So I don't want to say that the HDMI cable itself is completely out of the question as being the culprit here. That said... We've had plenty of people where they've got a projector and they've got a television and everything is exactly the way it should be and you still end up with issues when both of them are, you know, plugged into the AV receiver at the same time to the two HDMI outputs and no matter what you do, there's issues there. So the solution there is I don't know if you are using your projector and your TCL TV at the same time. Many people are not, right? Many people, they're watching the TV, then their screen comes down and they're watching the projector and they're not using both at the exact same time. If that's you, if you're never using them at the same time, you can, uh, if you're just using the remote that comes with your Denon, you can go into the menu and select whether HDMI output one or HDMI output two or both are active. And that almost always clears it up. If you say, okay, I'm only using HDMI output one right now, then when I switch to my projector, I'm using HDMI output two, but not both, that almost always works. Now, we can't say go get a Harmony anymore. I really wish we could because Harmony had the discrete codes where you could have a button right on the Harmony remote that just ought, like, one button push and it switched to HDMI output one on the Denon and then one button push and it switched right. to HDMI output two. Those IR codes exist if you get something like a Rumi remote or even just a learning remote that allows you to, uh, what would you have to do? You can't even do IR learning. It would have to be one like a Pronto that lets you plug in the hex codes. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the IR codes exist in the database for HDMI output one and HDMI output two on the Denon as discrete uh, IR codes. Uh, you can certainly do it over IP control. That's another one. Maybe that's the easiest. Get the app. Get the Denon app on your phone and do it over IP control. That's probably the, the easiest and cheapest if you don't want to invest in a Rumi remote. Um, God, I wish the Harmony wasn't gone. It was so much easier when you could say just get uh, a Harmony. <laughs> that the other day me. I was looking at Amazon, it popped up like a Harmony Elite. and I Renewed, and I like, no, right? They have the just, renewed ones. Yeah, the renewed ones. Yeah. I was like, we should just buy it. We should I just know. buy it to have a backup. But, yeah. All right. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, too, is if you are right, we've talked about this a number of times before, but if your sources have the ability to lower the, uh, the YC 
CPR yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, the four two zero instead of four four four. Yeah. Yeah, that that might help you out as well. But yeah. like Rob's saying, you know, two HMI handshakes at the same time. Yeah. Sometimes it just doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. So, yep. you know. So he says if he skips forward on his Bell TV DVR, sometimes the sound cuts out. Any way to fix that? Don't don't skip forward, but um <laughs> no, that's that that too. I mean, I've actually had that issue with uh it's funny. Uh, so so ever since the Xbox Series X has gotten the upgrade to Bitstream and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh I turned off the 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 bitstream output, and then I have it. I I've been testing the Atmos version versus yeah. the DTSX version. Sure, yeah. And the DTSX version does that all the time. Oh, it cuts out. Oh yeah, you start yeah, yeah, you'll yeah. start something, and it just won't it won't have any audio. There you go. And then you you have to pause it and then start it again, or rewind <laughs> it a little bit, and then it'll kick in. So, you know, Microsoft's just absolutely killing it with this uh, yeah. audio thing. I, I expect in twenty forty two for them to finally get it right. Sure. Um, yeah, I've had this issue with my Shaw DVR. I have Shaw instead of Bell in Canada, but I've I've had uh, issues like this too. There, uh, there's like there's nothing you can change in your Denon settings mm-hmm. to stop this from happening. It's not that. What I will say is, very often on the DVRs, the optical audio output works better than the HDMI audio output. Uh, so just plugging in an optical audio cable and going with that. That's pretty easy. Uh, it's it's a little bit cumbersome that you have to have an additional cable, but optical cables are light and easy and cheap. So maybe give that a try. And I've certainly found in my case that sometimes solves the issue. Okay. Carl. Carl says, we are definitely not the only podcast to do it, but his wife asked him why we all frequently compare the way a movie looks and sounds at home versus a commercial cinema. Carl and his wife agree. There's no comparison in their opinions. I don't know which they think is better. So doing so is pointless. They love their home theater with their projection set up. It's large for a house, but their local IMAX or Dolby Cinema is just a completely different experience. So why even try to compare? Because um, it's the same movie. It's the same thing. I'm Because we're trying to recreate one in another place. <laughs> I mean, wh- how else do you know if you've succeeded if you don't mm-hmm. compare? Now, they're, they're saying you can... Like, there's no point in even trying because you never can because your home theater is never going to be the same size as a commercial movie theater. I, and I would I would venture to say that's factually, objectively incorrect because I've been in home theaters where oh, I, I have see. to... You know, I've, I've actually had to look, you know, move my eyes around to see the whole screen and it's sitting like in the, almost in the no, back but the, row. the room so. itself was of a similar size to a commercial movie theater? No, I mean, no, some no. Super but the experience people, is the yes. same. Ah, yeah, well, the, so the experience is... In Carl and his wife's opinion, it is not that that the mm. the just the sheer physical size of the room and the number of seats that it holds makes it so that there's no comparison. Uh, that that that's part of it. And I mean, unless you are incredibly wealthy and literally have a full size commercial movie theater sized room, I mean, I can't I can't argue with that. But I mean, here so. I can get into the nitty gritty details of, I can look at the contrast, right? What is the contrast of the image being shown to me? Is, is the size of my home theater, even with a projection setup, going to literally be the same size as my commercial movie theater screen? No, there's no arguing that, but I can look at the contrast. I can look at the, you know, seeming color accuracy. I don't have them side by side, but I can look at that thing. Number one is really the contrast. Um, Audio wise, I can certainly make a comparison between clarity and, uh, you know, fidelity of the audio that I'm hearing. I can, I can absolutely make that comparison. So, I mean, yeah, in an overall sense, obviously my my tiny little den does not replicate a full size commercial movie theater. No argument from me there. But I can I can compare some technical aspects of the picture I'm looking at and the sound that I'm hearing. I I can compare those things when it's the same movie, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that the physical experience of being inside a larger movie theater is all that relevant when, you know, you are mostly looking at a screen and not paying attention to it. Like, the only time <laughs> I look around at people around me is that somebody's distracting me from the movie. Mm-hmm. And that happens in my home theater as well. So, I mean, I guess I'm still getting the same experience. I have to yell at my 13-year-old son to go take his phone and plug it mm-hmm. in a different room so he doesn't look at his phone. Uh, you know, my... 11 year old son is always you know asking me what does that mean daddy i'm like shut up you'll figure it out be quiet <laughs> ask me afterwards so i'm still having some some of those experiences i don't understand 
this whole well it is different by definition because the room is larger because yeah. we can recreate like the only thing i can say that my home theater does not do that my i have experienced in a movie theater mm -hmm. uh is physical wind on my legs. Okay, yeah. Which used to happen at uh, Grauman's or Man's or whatever it's called now. TCL uh, now. TCL Chinese theater. TCL Chinese theater, Chinese theater. okay. <laughs> uh, that used to happen there all the time. I used to think there were ants in there because I thought they right. you know, I'd feel the wind going up my pant leg or whatever. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. But shaking of the seats, the big picture, mm -hmm. the bright colors, the contrast. You can certainly get to the, the same measurable sound pressure level. That is yeah. absolutely doable at home. All the things that make a movie a movie mm. are recreatable at home. Uh, the fact that I'm not in a massive room when it happens, it's not the not the most important right. part of the experience. Now, when I was watching Black Widow in IMAX versus watching Black Widow at home, um, I could recreate a very similar field of view. But there is no question that, of course, I am sitting much closer to the screen right. at home than I right. am at IMAX. Now, for me, I actually, I was actually thinking this while I was in the IMAX theater and having that very similar field of view. I was like, I'm actually kind of surprised how how close the experience at home really is. I, I was kind of remarking that to myself in my own brain. I've been away from movie theaters for over a year. And going back, I was like, how much, how, you know, what am I going to notice? And I actually remarked on that to myself. But some people, because uh, once the screen is more than 15 feet away, uh, just the focal length in our eyes, it goes to infinite focus. Our eyes don't, uh, there's no more adjusting of the lens in our in our eye, the physical lens in our eye is not adjusting anymore beyond 15 feet away. Whereas closer than 15 feet, it is. And some people um, really feel that. They can really, really notice when something is much closer to them. It's taking up the same field of view, but it's much closer. And therefore, the, the physical lens in your eye is actually moving to adjust. Um, mm -hmm. And some people really, really feel that and notice that. I was remarking to myself, I was like, I'm not noticing that as much as I... I thought I might or thought I would. So maybe for, for Carl and his wife there that they they really, really noticed that with their eye going to full infinite focus, you know, more than fifteen feet away. That that could be part of it. But anyway, I, I think we've covered it. That's yeah. that's my take. <laughs> Brandon, Brandon has a Sony X900F TV, recently has started rebooting every so often, usually within minutes of uh, mm. turning it on, and then it's okay after that. So it isn't the end of the world, but it's still annoying. It's also mm. begun having a glitch where it will flash a white screen for a very brief moment. It's super quick, and it doesn't happen very often. Any ideas on what might be causing this, uh, how to maybe fix it, and is it a known issue? Uh, that sounds like something super breaking. <laughs> it just yeah, hasn't totally like broken yet. That sounds yeah. like a failing power supply. It really does, yeah. uh, which is very common. Unfortunately, it's very common in televisions uh, for power supplies to eventually start to go on the fritz. Thankfully, it is not a difficult or expensive repair uh, because it is quite common and because the power supplies are basically modular and it's not that hard. Any TV repair shop uh, can replace the power supply. In a Sony television, they won't have difficulty getting the parts for that either. Uh, but that's really what it sounds like. I would certainly get in touch with Sony. I would describe the problems. I would be, you know, you know expecting them to say, okay, here's the authorized service center. Being an X900F, you're almost certainly out of warranty period unless you bought a very extended warranty from wherever you purchased it from. If they say you have to pay for the repair, I don't think that's unfair uh, being outside of the manufacturer's warranty period. But yeah, I highly suspect a failing power supply. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I scroll down. We recently explained that Atmos and DTS X basically keep the sounds in two separate layers, a base layer for the ear height speakers and the overhead layer for the top height or top speakers. But when we were explaining what you should label your overhead speakers, didn't we say it's best to call them heights because if you label them as tops, then DTS X will mix some of the overhead sounds into the front left and right and surround left and right speakers. What is he missing here? Mm -hmm. I That's was actually kind of hoping somebody would ask this question. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I'm hoping you'll answer it then. Yeah, so, um, okay. Okay, I think the easiest way to explain it is that, in essence, uh, these uh, object-based audio systems, Atmos and DTS-X, they still behave as though the speakers themselves are in fixed channel positions, right? They tell you the names and the locations and the, you know, the range of angles, but essentially the locations of where all the speakers should go. And even though the sounds in the signal 
might be encoded as objects that just have three-dimensional coordinates attached to them, and it's up to the renderer in the AV receiver, the processing unit in the AV receiver, to figure out how to position those coordinates based on the speakers that you have. The speakers themselves are still treated like fixed channel positions. So the signal of the audio, when that signal comes into your AV receiver and it comes to the render and the render says, I have a bed level, ear level speakers, and I have at least two overhead speakers. And in this case, four, if you've got, say, top fronts and top rears, it says, okay, I have these physically separate speakers that are handling the overhead sounds. So all of the sounds get put into that overhead layer. All the sounds that are overhead, they get put in that overhead layer, and none of that sound gets put into the bed layer. But the way DTS-X handles the four overhead speaker positions is it's really only coded for front heights and rear heights. And if you do not have speakers labeled as front heights and rear heights, it says, well, I only really know how to think of the overhead layer in terms of front heights and rear heights. So if you tell me what you have are top fronts and top rears, all of the overhead sounds, I'm going to play it as though you have front heights and rear heights. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use a combination of your top front left and your main front left speaker. Those are going to play together to try and give me the position of a front height speaker. That's like the logic that's being applied. So it's acting as if you had a front height speaker that it's saying, well, the way I'm going to get a front height speaker is by combining the top front left and the main front left and the top front right and the main front right. I'm going to combine those and play them together. And that's how I'm going to get my front height speakers. But then all the objects are played. Like imagine that you have this like fixed phantom front height speaker. Right. It's going to, it's going to then apply the rendering processing of the object as though that's where the sound is coming from is from this phantom front height position. So yeah, it's this weird combination of the speakers are treated like channels, but the objects are that then use the channels in a mixture to try and make the sound come from where the coordinates say the sound sh sound should come from. So when you label your speakers as tops instead of heights and you're using DTS-X, then essentially some sound is always going to be coming out of the bed level speakers. You don't really want it to. You want it to be discrete in just the overhead speakers, the physically overhead speakers, but because it's like, oh, the only way I can create a front height channel is by making a phantom front height speaker and a phantom rear height speaker, then it plays all of the overhead sounds out of a mixture of the two. But what it isn't doing is like giving you a smooth transition of, okay, all the sound is in the top speaker and then it transitions to being partly in the top speaker and partly in the main speaker and then all in the main speaker, like one continuous object. Right. It doesn't do that. It just goes, oh, I have a mix of a phantom front height now and that's how it processes the sound. It is weird, but that's what's going on. <laughs> okay. John. John appreciate our uh, our comments on, about the graphic EQ he was considering for his all balanced all XLR connection headphone setup. Mm -hmm. Behringer's Ultra Curve Pro parametric EQ is reasonably priced compared to most other offerings at about three hundred bucks. The only thing holding him back was seeing several customer reviews that mentioned failing power supplies. Then again, there seem to be a group of people who just hate on Behringer everywhere on the web. So is it worth taking a chance? He's willing to go for it on our say so. I do, I do this all the time. I read the reviews, and there's you know. Whenever I see something like that where, I mean, unless it's like chronic and we just, you just right. get it over and over and over again, you know, there's nothing's per perfectly quality controlled. There's always going to be issues sure. somewhere. So uh, I just do what any reasonable person would do. And that is assume that if something like that's going to fail, it's going to happen fairly quickly. Right. Uh, usually within the warranty period. Mm -hmm. And I order it from someplace where I can return it easily for mm -hmm. no charge and then plug it in immediately, see how it goes and then go on with my life. Now, if I read a bunch of reviews or I go out there and I see that, that this is a real problem, which does happen, it's rare, mm -hmm. but it does happen where an entire product line is just kind of hosed. Well, <laughs> then I would not, I would choose on something. I would choose something else. But 
usually I would order it anyways. I just be I would just yeah. be a little bit more careful about, about the return policy. Uh, one of the definite potential culprits for why this device specifically earlier on had quite a few reports of failing power supplies and then more recently doesn't seem to have those. Not just that maybe Behringer did change something in their supply chain. That's a possibility. But uh, this was one of the earlier devices that had the switch mode power supplies. Uh, what you're mm. finding in all computers and that now are these switch mode power supplies. But this is a rack mounted device. It comes with the rack ears. And I, I genuinely believe a lot of people, because this is one of the earlier switch mode power supplies, they're plugging it into the surge protector that was built into their rack. And a lot of those surge protectors were stepped approximations of sine waves, uh, mm. as opposed to the the full, you know, recreated sine wave uh, that a lot of people, a lot of that rack protection equipment was those stepped approximations. And when you combine that with a switch mode power supply, you will very often fry the power supply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'm just like, I'm, I'm piecing that all together. I don't have any hard proof or evidence that that's the case, but just logically, it makes a lot of sense that people weren't looking for that because this was one of the earlier devices to use this new type of power supply. And given that it's a rack mounted device and it's so common to have the stepped approximation surge protectors in racks in equipment racks it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's what was going wrong in a lot of these cases because uh, the if you're looking at the most recent reviews nobody seems to be having this problem anymore so I would certainly say uh, buy it from a place like Amazon or Sweetwater that has a good return policy um, Behringer stands behind their products they stand behind their warranty and I agree with Tom if it's going to fail it's probably going to fail within the first year while you're still under warranty so I think it's worth a try Okay. Uh, he got his Bic speakers, the ones uh, he was considering stuffing their uh, tweeter horns with gauze at a very good price. If he were to look at other speakers, he'd want to keep the price around three hundred dollars each. Are there any high efficiency, high output options at that price point with strong but not too boomy bass output and smoother treble than his Bic Acoustes Acoustec towers, <laughs> with or without horns? Mm. Um, so I don't remember why he wants high output. Is it because he's sitting far away or? I mean, he's not super far away. He's got plans for these enormous DIY subwoofers. He seems to want very high output capabilities. He's looking at Crown Professional amps or, you know, something akin that's got at least 200 watts per hour. It seems like he wants crazy loud output capabilities. Um, yeah, it's, it's just what he wants, uh, but he's not yeah. super completely happy with his picks. Now, same advice. You're working on your DIY subs. Get those installed first because that's going to alleviate a ton of the base responsibilities of your current speakers. And that'll probably be enough to clear up any concerns about boominess or whatever in your current big speakers. And then he's also working on DIY acoustic treatments that he has not installed yet. And he's looking at getting equalization equipment. All of those things first. He's, he, those are already underway before you go replacing your speakers right. and very very potentially spending needlessly. There's every chance in the world that once you have your subwoofers properly integrated with your existing speakers, your acoustic treatments put up, and then equalization applied, that you're going to be perfectly happy with your existing big speakers. Uh, so I definitely wouldn't go shopping for speakers until all of that stuff is done first. But that said, just to answer the question as wrote, uh, I would certainly consider JBL's Stage series. Uh, that's the first thought I had for this price range for all the things that he mentioned. Uh, JBL's and stage we're looking series. at bookshelves at this point, right? I mean, well, he's he wants towers, out. and I mean, he does have a, a physically large space. His theater area is not gigantic, but the rest of his room, uh, you know, expands way back behind his theater area. So I don't think mm. towers are unreasonable in his setup. Uh, the JBL stage series, absolutely, probably the A one eighties, which retail for four hundred dollars each, but they do go on sale quite frequently over at Crutchfield. Um, I find the JBL stage series bass heavy <laughs> but it sounds like maybe he wants that um mm. i do think they have a better tweeter than what's in the bix so uh that that was my first thought close to my only thought uh because the only other ones that i really uh would maybe point you to are uh, hsu's um their hc1 mark ii uh which is like uh, when you look at it, it, it looks like a center speaker, and that is sort of the way it's designed. But you can rotate the horn in the HC1 Mark II. You can rotate the horn 90 degrees and stand it vertically and have it as a, a dual woofer horn-loaded tweeter, a large bookshelf. Uh, but it sounds like he really, really wants towers, so whether he'd even want a bookshelf model on a stand, I don't know. So those those are the ones I would 
you know, suggest to you at, for the question yeah, as this price but, point, it's almost impossible to get anything that's really all right, that yeah. linear. Yeah, the uh, HSU HC1 Mark Tower. IIs, they're they're two hundred sixty dollars each, so they're they're within this price range for sure. Uh, but def- all the other things that you're already working on, all the other uh, you know pokers that you already have in the fire, get get those completed first before you go changing speakers. All right, uh, John took our comments about his DIY subwoofer designs under advisement and returned to Win uh, ISD to see what alternatives he could come up with. That's the flat cat subs right that's the one that we're that's right the ones you thought okay. might might tip over and flatten a cat i i thought a cat would turn itself into liquid cat and go into the slot port <laughs> that he wants to build <laughs> by switching to a larger cabinet with an internal volume of 3.8 cubic feet and changing the driver to uh, dayton something 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 he came up with a design <laughs> that appears to be free of the resonance and electrical impedance concerns we expressed about his original design the Dayton uh, driver has a natural resonant frequency below 20 hertz and a stiffer suspension, leading to a very benign-looking electrical impedance curve and very linear calculated frequency response from basically 18 hertz to over 100 hertz. The new cabinets would have a footprint of 24 by 15, and they'd be 38 inches tall, and the outer walls would be 2 inches thick, 2 inches thick, and the inner walls and port walls would be uh, 1.5 and 1.7 inches thick. So it's a slot ported design again, Mm -hmm. which he seems to be kind of in love with, uh, with a little bit of a a taper at the end there, it looks like. With the port bending somewhat on the inside and being rounded and flared, and with the cabinet walls being so thick, would he need additional internal bracing? And what are our thoughts on the new design with the Dayton driver and larger ported cabinet? Uh, Where is the driver in this bad boy? At the top by the port. Yeah, or may yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be the top in the way that he's rendered it there, sort of on the side of it. So this is a a tall, some fairly slender, fifteen inch wide rectangle. That's what he's built with the port coming right out the top, and then the uh, eighteen inch driver on the side of the cabinet. I. I do think you still need more internal I bracing. Would think so. I mean, there's a big empty spot. That's oh yeah, there in is. Here that, uh, <laughs> now this I, I this would... can come in the form of. Uh, a two in one. It can be the brace for the magnet of the driver as well as further bracing the cabinet itself. You can sort of kill right. two birds with one stone because I wouldn't want to have that gigantic Dayton 18 inch driver just 100% supported when it's facing sideways just by the outer flange. I wouldn't want that. I want some additional support for the magnet inside of this cabinet. And and then you can you can, you know, kill two birds with one stone. That can serve as additional bracing for the cabinet itself. But so I mean, I know he's thinking, "Oh, I've got super thick inert resin-based walls. That's what he's going for." He's like, "I I can't need more bracing than that." I'm like, "Oh yeah, you can." <laughs> <laughs> Look at a concrete bridge, man. Things can still move when you've yeah. got, you know, large uh, SPL and, and, and you know, frequencies that are going at a while there and it might be the resonant frequency of the cabinet material itself. Um, I would have more bracing than that, but I think you can t- kill two birds with one stone. Um, mm. As for the design overall, I'm much happier with this one. I, I looked up all the Win ISD specs and that on this, uh, this, this driver makes much more sense to me than the, what was targeted at car audio driver, the scar audio driver that he originally started with that really looked like it was just trying to rock your world at 50 Hertz and little else. Um, I think this is a much more suitable driver for what you want to go for. Uh, you'll be able to have the port tuning right down at 17 or 18 Hertz and coincide with the natural resonant frequency of the driver itself. Itself. Um, given the larger cabinet volume, you shouldn't have any more problem up around 60 hertz the way your original design did. So uh, I'm I'm much happier with this design if if it means anything to John. I'm super uncomfortable saying that we have any idea exactly how much bracing you should put in this thing, though, because it seems to oh, okay. me he needs. I mean, just supporting the driver is one thing. I mean, that's yeah. gonna that's gonna help, but that that would still leave because where the driver is placed at the sort of top yeah. he still has about 50 percent of the real estate of that yes. front that front thing yeah and all of the back part of it essentially not supported i mean other than yeah. by whatever brace you put behind the driver it would seem to me you would still need like a third of the way into the cabinet some additional bracing like a yeah. like a cutout one you know to keep that keep things as inert as possible or maybe mm-hmm. even two when you see the internal bracing on some of the not just diy but the professional subwoofers that are mm-hmm. very very big it's like a spider web in there yeah you know they just have cutouts everywhere going all kind of different directions trying to keep things inert yeah and if you're looking um, at power sound audio or, or jtr or something like that it's not 
not like they're skimping on the thickness of the outer walls. No, you right. Know? It's, it's not like they're going thin there and that's the only reason they need more internal abrasion. No, far from it. They're going with the external walls just as thick as what you're proposing. And yeah, Tom is absolutely right. There's a lot more bracing in there than, than that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can just Google like internal bracing subwoofer and look at the images mm. that you'll see and you'll see you know they don't go longer than six inches without a brace you know right. a full brace going across the entire thing and that includes drive you know subwoofers with multiple drivers or big drivers or anything else and you're saying i've got one long thing going up the side here mm -hmm. and therefore and that's a couple of inches off the off the one wall and they're still 20 inches off the you know that, that are <laughs> completely unbraced and that's going to be okay just look at the bracing of other DIY projects and everything else and it is nuts how much bracing is going on in here and you're you're not even considering that so I mm. would at the very least look at that and try to come up with a, a plan that involves a lot more bracing which is going to change the dimensions of your sub because the more bracing you put in there the less internal volume you have because right. you're sucking some of it up which means you'll have to redo your calculations Th this is why I don't design speakers because <laughs> it at one little change changes everything. You got to go right. back to the drawing board. This is why you spend five hundred dollars for a sub instead of uh, instead of trying just throwing together you know a box and throwing a driver in it and an external amp. It's because it's hard, and that's why you know we don't do it. Lastly, rather than having the two subs directly on either side of the couch and stuck to the floor with Velcro, which was he was willing, he was suggesting he would do, which mm -hmm. is not what we would recommend he'd be willing to put them against the side walls but he was still thinking they'd go to the left and right of his couch towards the back of his theater area which would mean both subs, subs would be about a third of the room's length from the front wall what do we think i think you don't listen to this podcast is what i think <laughs> honestly because it, what world would we ever suggest that because we never would now i now, know that having, you, having this it... is the problem you want to get a bunch of bass, but you right. want to only stay in the theater area <laughs> and not go to the back of the room, yeah. which has the fridge and some mm -hmm. other things back there that I can't read on the stupid picture. So he's got a kitchen, and you don't. That's not how it works. That's not it how really sound not, works. Yeah, and it, so, it's not that it's going to be louder in the theater area because the subwoofers are physically subwoofers closer, are closer to the seats. Yeah. It that that the sound waves they are traveling at eleven hundred feet per second. All right, you are not hearing that deep bass sound wave prior to it having bounced off of multiple walls. Even in this fairly long, fairly large room, it is still bouncing off the side walls, the ceiling multiple times before it ever reaches your ear. It is easily making it across your room and back more than once before you ever hear the sound. So this notion that having it physically closer to you is either going to contain it or make it louder at your seat versus some other part of the room, it, it just doesn't work that way. The higher it's frequencies erroneous. do work that way. The directional yeah. frequencies, the high frequencies that are short wavelengths that do make it to your ear straight from the driver to your ear before ever making it to a wall and bouncing off, they do work that way, but bass does not. Now, if you're just like, because what we suggested was the middle of the left wall and the middle of the right wall of the entire length of the room, which would put both of the subs behind the theater area, but halfway between the theater area and the kitchenette area. That's That was our initial impression uh, suggestion. Now, if you're like, that, that isn't going to work for me for whatever reason, decorating, having one sub, say the sub on the left side of the room, one third of the length of the room on the left side from the front wall, and, but then having the second sub on the right-hand wall, two thirds of the room's length from the front wall, one third of the room's length from the back wall. So they are diagonally yeah, it's across back from in each that other. Kitchenette. It'll be back in sure. that kitchenette. That's just the way it goes. But but that 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 I'd be perfectly fine with. You know, if if directly in the middle of the two side walls doesn't work for some reason, having them diagonally across from each other, perfectly fine with that. Uh, but I would not have them both one third of the room's length from the front wall. I wouldn't have them both there. You're not taking advantage of what will mathematically work best for your for your base. That's all. Right. You can put them wherever the heck you want. You I mean, we can. can't stop you. But we you are asking us where to put it to get the best base in here and that's where the, that's what to do yeah. that's just it so my wife has a meeting that i have to let her get to uh, so this okay. next question is stupid long well the text so, is i don't uh, yeah that's fine but i think uh let's see 
Dawn's is definitely something we could answer next week. Um, Jeremy's is as well. Can we maybe do John M's? That's a couple parts. That's the last one. Okay, let's just do that. We'll do John M. John M. Because okay. This is it. Skip so John has an LG UF8600 OLED TV. That was one of the earliest OLED TVs with 4K resolution HDR, but it has some significant limitations. It can only deliver Dolby Vision from its built-in apps. It can't accept Dolby Vision from external source, and it will only output stereo audio from... Uh, ARC, audio return channel, or optical, definitely no Atmos. <laughs> the reason he hasn't upgraded his TV is because he's Gasp, a 3D fan. Yeah. We found the other one, Tom. There we knew you from Quantum Entanglement, together. there must be one other one out there besides me. You guys, you guys should move in together. You guys would be buddies. <laughs> Watch the 3D movies. It's be stupid. He's got a large collection of 3D Blu-rays that he enjoys, and this older OLED delivers the best 3D experience with this passive 3D glasses. Do we think that maybe a the new uh, Avatar sequels might create a resurgence or at least a single production run of modern OLEDs with passive 3D included? Jonathan came across a Tech Radar article that explains how 4K TVs could and should have saved 3D TVs, but instead they just replaced them was that secretly rob writing under a pen name probably but uh <laughs> it was not yeah. i can promise you that <laughs> it, uh, i i see no world where we're 20 years from 3d making its next research <laughs> every 20 years or so it does 20, seem to be years, cyclical <laughs> yeah the, 3d comes back and do i it think it might be avatar that long will... before the avatar sequels come out at this rate <laughs> Apparently, that man that has no need to make any more money right now. He's making he enough doesn't. money just by living that he does not need to go stressing himself out by trying to make... And what is it? supposed to be like six sequels now or something? It keeps increasing. It's at like least the four. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's gotten ridiculous. So, uh, I, I honestly... I hear you. I yeah. empathize with you. I'm sure there's people out there who agree with you. I'm not one of them. But, <laughs> yeah, 3D is dead. 3D has been dead for a long time. It was yeah. dead. It was DOA, to be honest with you. Everybody was like, "Why are we paying extra for this?" But they, they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the first Avengers movie. If that did not kill 3D by itself, it should have <laughs> because it was just ludicrously bad. Yeah, I really can't place my bet on uh, on large 3D TVs ever coming back. I can't place my bet on that. What would not be out of the realm of possibility in my mind, being James Cameron, is the notion that the Avatar sequels might come out in VR at some point. Uh, and yeah. that'll be your 3D. Like, if he did that, I wouldn't. it wouldn't phase me. Yeah, I wouldn't why be don't like, you no dump that TV that. and buy an Oculus Rift 2 or <laughs> Oculus Quest or whatever it is? Don't do uh, that if you like 3D so much. Do that. Beat Saber well, awesome. Well, that works connecting it to a 3D Blu-ray player. I don't know if that actually works. I don't think it has that capability. I don't think the Royal Moons are out there anymore either. Those got discontinued. I have no idea what you're talking about. John has <laughs> tried a bunch of different Roku streaming devices on most services. He can manage to get Atmos audio with the Roku plugged straight into his receiver, but 4K and HDR can be t troublesome. Disney Plus seems to be the most problematic because he hasn't found any way to separate 4K resolution from Atmos audio and Dolby Vision. Mm -hmm. So he just appled an Apple. He just ordered an <laughs> Apple TV 4K. He just appled it. He yeah, just appled can, it. At this point, we might as well just call it that. We just apple oh. things. <laughs> We should call it Amazon things, but whatever. He hadn't received it yet at the time of his of this email. Will that uh, allow him to watch Disney Plus with Atmos Audio, but without Dolby Vision? If not, is there any streaming device that will? So what we have discovered, Rob and I, through our limited testing, mm -hmm. is that with different streaming services on different devices, mm -hmm. you get different results. Yes, you so do. So <laughs> with my Xbox Series X, if I am watching... If I'm trying to bit stream from the device yeah. to my receiver and I have a 1080p display, yeah. then I can't get 4K, which means I also cannot get Atmos with some apps. That's right. Like the Atmos is tied to the 4K. And Disney get, Plus is one of them in, in your case on the Xbox. In my case. Yeah. Yes. So it, if you are finding that this is the this is the case, you know, you, you know, there could be it is a mess basically is what i'm saying <laughs> it's a mess and it's inexplicable and i've been writing to write an article about it but i'm always uh -huh. like how do you even write this article because there's no way you can test every device every app everything right. and figure out what's going on so yeah it's 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 a mess it's a mess so happily the apple tv 4k is one where i i got it by i manually set mine to output 1080p sdr on my Apple TV 4K, and Atmos still played from Disney+. Plus. 
So the chances are there. Now the question is, here's the question. Uh, when you connect your Apple TV 4K to your AV receiver and then your AV receiver to this older LG OLED, is the Apple TV 4K going to receive a little flag that says this is a Dolby Vision capable television? Because it sounds like it won't. Right? The TV he has doesn't accept Dolby Vision from any external sources. It'll only go into Dolby Vision mode right. from its own built-in apps. So that would be best. That would be a good thing because there's essentially two options you have in the settings for your Apple TV 4K. Uh, in all scenarios, you are going to set your Apple TV 4K's default resolution output to 4K SDR. And that should definitely work, all right? If you set it to 4K SDR, you should absolutely still be able to get Atmos audio from Disney Plus on the Apple TV 4K. The only question is whether you are going to turn on the match dynamic range setting. And I mean, this is something you can simply try. Because if you leave match dynamic range off, then you are not going to see HDR of any kind from Disney Plus anymore. It's always going to be 4K standard dynamic range. You'll get the Atmos audio, but you won't have HDR. If you're like, I would really like to have HDR 10, just not Dolby Vision, because his Roku is like, if you're watching Disney+, Plus, the HDR I'm going to give you is Dolby Vision and nothing but, apparently. And if you can't do that, then I'm not going to give you Atmos. <laughs> but with the Apple TV 4K, you definitely can have some separations. So if the flag is not there, if the Apple TV 4K says, yes, this is an HDR 10 display, but not a Dolby Vision display, then the match dynamic range might work. You can try it. You can, it, you know, you can try it. It's a setting. Nothing, you can nothing try like being it. able to say, I don't know. That's basically what we're yeah. saying. I mean, this is, these are all the possibilities. These are the possibilities. The end, I don't, don't know. know for sure, but at least you can try it. And 4K SDR with match dynamic range off, that should definitely work. It's just you won't be seeing HDR from Disney+. Plus. Uh, now, the other device that... I think would work um, would be the Nvidia Shield because with the Nvidia Shield to get Atmos from Disney Plus it does have to be 4K resolution. Uh, if you set the Nvidia Shield to 1080p, it will not let you play Atmos from Disney Plus. I tried it and it doesn't work. Uh, but as long as you're using 4K resolution, it will let you output Atmos. It doesn't have to be Dolby Vision. Now with the Nvidia Shield you can actually set it to either be similarly 4K SDR at all times, no HDR of any kind, and that should work. But you also have the option in the NVIDIA, uh, in the NVIDIA Shield of 4K HDR10 ready, but not Dolby Vision. There's also the option of HDR10 and Dolby Vision ready. And you can manually select that in the NVIDIA Shield. So if you select 4K HDR10 ready, but not Dolby Vision ready, I think it should work. So the Apple TV 4K and the NVIDIA Shield are your two best bets, but I think the Apple TV 4K will work for you. There, the end. So who uh, is left on the list? We have, we skipped over, let's see, I got to scroll back up to Dawn see who's got and the something else. There was Rob W. Uh, we went over his because his was a longer looking question. Don S and Jeremy W. You three gentlemen are first up next week. Sorry, we didn't get to you this week. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank our 127 patrons over at Patreon.com, including James W. Yes, indeed. 127 patrons at Patreon.com slash Podcast. If you would like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, James, thanks so much for being one of them. Apologies if people are hearing the thumping. They have begun work on the outset of my building, but thankfully it's at the end of the podcast here. Woohoo! Uh, we also want to thank uh, Justin B., uh, Brandon, Gorinder, Rob, W again, Jeremy, and James for the notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going. For sure. Justin, Brandon, Gorinder, Rob, Jeremy, and James, thank you all very much for those notes of gratitude and the notes of encouragement. Really do appreciate it. Thank you again to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. All right. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andrew. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.